Today, I'm going to share with you a mining stock investment strategy that has been incredibly successful for me. It's actually a strategy that I came up with and it has just two simple rules. It's not that these rules are something that nobody has ever spoken about. People talk about them all the time, but I've never heard of anyone using an investing strategy with just these two rules, but it actually typically works out pretty good. So in this video, I'm gonna share with you what those two rules are, and then we're going to build a portfolio of mining stock companies together using those two simple rules. The first rule in this strategy is that management has to have been very successful in the past. A management team that has been super successful in the past is a critical element to this investing strategy because if somebody has made investors money in the past, it's much more likely that they're going to make you money than a management team who hasn't made investors any money in the past. Now, when it comes to exploring for natural resources and developing the projects and mining them and building the mines, there is so much to know. And even if you spend your whole life dedicated to this industry, there will still be a lot that you will never know. That's why it's so important to have a great management team who knows how to manage people, who knows how to hire the right people, who have the skills necessary in every single aspect of the business to make it a successful company. So when you invest in great management that has been successful in the past, preferably many times in the past, well, then you're going to increase your chances of success by a lot. Requirement number two for this investment strategy is that the stock you are buying is cheap. Typically you want the industry or the stock to be out of favor and unloved by investors. So great management and cheap. Those are the two requirements. So using those two requirements, let's go build a portfolio. So the first very successful management team we're going to look at is the Lundin Group, the Lundin family. They've been incredibly successful for many decades, and I would gladly get involved in just about any project that they're doing. So let's go check out what options there are in the Lundin Group. So Bluestone Resources, they have a gold development project in Guatemala. They had a fully permitted mine. However, they decided to change the mine plan from underground to open pit. And because of that, they had to file for an amendment to their permits and they've been waiting a couple of years. And I think the market is just getting bored with it and the stock has sold off like crazy over the past couple of years. So this stock is very cheap. In my opinion, of all of the companies out of the Lundin Group, this is the cheapest. So this is definitely going into our portfolio. So next, let's look at Philo Corp. So Philo is a copper discovery play in Argentina and it has been incredibly successful. It's been one of the biggest winners in the whole industry. They had a huge discovery back here in 2021. And right now for a discovery play, uh, for I mean, for an exploration company, it's just way too expensive for me. I can't justify paying over a 2 billion US market cap for this. Now, maybe someone will make a lot of money out of this, but it's going to be a long time in the making. So although this is great management, I wouldn't call Philo cheap. Next is International Petroleum Corp. I'm gonna skip this one because I don't know enough about it. Next, Lucara Diamond. Yes, this one would be technically cheap, so it would meet these two qualifications. However, I recently was shopping for an engagement ring. And in my personal experience, I saw how much cheaper it was to buy lab-grown diamonds the natural diamonds. So, I mean, with how good lab grown diamonds are, I can't see the diamond price coming back. The diamond price has fallen off a cliff and usually it's a good time to buy when the prices are low, but that's one that I think is gonna stay low. So, although it meets my requirements, I'm not putting it in the portfolio. Next is Lundin Gold. So Lundin Gold, they have one mine, the Fruta del Norte mine, in Ecuador. So the truth is that Lundin Gold has been incredibly successful and they've just been coming out with great news after great news. And because of this, the stock is not cheap. I'm not saying it's a bad investment because that, that deposit that they have is incredible. However, it's not cheap. And I have a feeling that they're going to be buying another company here in the not too distant future. And 
When that happens, it's probably going to be at a premium and the acquiring company typically falls a lot on that news. So that might be a time when it would be cheap enough to get in, but I'm not getting into Lundin Gold right now. So Lundin Mining is a diversified base metals miner that has operations in a number of parts of the world. And on a one-year basis, the stock price isn't cheap. However, you look back further and it is a bit cheaper. Now, just looking at the stock price really isn't enough. You need to be comparing it to other metrics as well. But for the sake of simplicity in this video, I'm trying to go through these companies quickly and build a portfolio quickly. So we're looking mostly at the stock price. Now, on a one-year chart, it's near the highs. Now, from a trading perspective, maybe you could get in around eight or 850 if you were patient. But this is one that I might buy a small tranche in right now and then later look to increase my position. So we've added Lundin Mining to our portfolio. And then there's three more companies here. But the truth is, I don't know enough about these companies to invest in them. So I'm just going to ignore those for now. So we now have two companies in our portfolio that are part of the Lundin group of companies. So now let's move on to the next super successful entrepreneur. And that is Ross Beatty. Ross Beatty has started like 15 companies in his career and they've all been a success. So the first Ross Beatty company that we're going to add to our portfolio is Pan American Silver. This is the closest thing to a blue chip silver stock you can get and silver is hated by investors right now and the stock price is seriously depressed. So great company, great management, definitely going on to our list. The next Ross Beatty company is Equinox Gold. This is the company that Ross is most involved in right now. The stock price is not doing well. However, gold is close to an all-time high and the gold miners are far from their all-time high. And in addition to that, Equinox has had some big problems with some of their mines and those problems are almost all resolved and we're about to get news on the last big potential problem, and that is the Greenstone mine that they're building in Canada. They're just finishing it, and they're commissioning it, and they're starting up the mine right now. If we get good news about the Greenstone mine, which I think we're going to, considering who's operating it, well then, the stock price, in my opinion, is going to go crazy. So Equinox Gold, easy add to our portfolio great management, and cheap. The next Ross Beatty company is Lumina Gold. They have a big copper gold development project in Ecuador that they've been trying to sell for a couple of years. And I think they're going to be able to sell it in the next year or two. And when they do, I think we're going to see a substantial gain from that. And heck, we may even see a big gain in the meantime as sentiment improves. So great management and cheap, Lumina Gold, is going on our list. Next is Luminex Resources, another Ross Beatty company. However, when you see this video, Luminex Resources may not exist because they recently announced a merger with Adventus Mining. Ross Beatty is going to be more than a 10% owner in the combined company, and it's a company that I'd be happy to own. As a matter of fact, I do own it. So yes, Luminex slash Adventus is the next one that's going on our portfolio list. The next very successful entrepreneur we're going to look at is Clive Johnson. So the first company of his that we're going to look at is lesser known and a very small company. So this company is B Metals Corp. It's a tiny little exploration company and on a historic stock price basis, it appears cheap. I honestly don't really know how to value this company and you're really investing in the people. However, the people have historically had a lot of success finding stuff. So the next company that's going on our list is B Metals Corp. And the most important company for Clive Johnson is B2 Gold. They've been very successful at building mines and working with governments and challenging places. And I think they're going to continue to do very good things. Their stock price doesn't look great right now, but that's just because all of these major gold miners are so depressed. And historically speaking, 
they're trading at some of the cheapest valuations on just about any valuation metric that you can measure. So the next company that's going onto our list is B2 Gold. So here we have a portfolio of eight companies from three different very successful mining entrepreneurs. All of these companies have great management and they're all cheap. So I'd be happy to own every single one of these with this investing in mining stock for dummies strategies. This is part two of my mining stocks for dummies series. And we're going to build a portfolio together in this video using companies that meet these two requirements. First up is Robert Friedland. Robert Friedland is one of the world's most successful mining financiers. And we have two companies of his that we're going to consider adding to our portfolio. Number one is Ivanhoe Mines. So as you can see, Ivanhoe Mines stock has performed very well over the past five years. Now, although the stock price is way up, this actually isn't a bad valuation in my opinion. However, I wouldn't call it cheap. So we're gonna keep it on our watch list. And if the valuation of that company declines by a substantial amount, well then maybe we'll consider picking some up. The next Robert Friedland company is Ivanhoe Electric. Although the stock price of Ivanhoe Electric is down quite a bit in the past year, I still wouldn't call it cheap. I still think it's a pretty expensive stock compared to what assets they have. And there's a lot of unknowns in the company. They're using new technology that we don't know how well it's going to work. So I'm going to hold off on buying Ivanhoe Electric for now. Next is Robert Quartermain. Robert Quartermain started out his career at tech where he had a lot of success. And then he built Silver Standard Resources from nothing into a huge company. And then he did it again with Precium, ended up selling that Bruce Jack mine for, I forget the amount, but I think it was a few billion dollars. And his current project is Dakota Gold. For a while, I thought Dakota Gold was just way too expensive. And by the way, when I'm talking about cheap or expensive, I'm not talking about the stock price. Like a $10 stock can be cheaper than a $2 stock because what we're talking about is their market cap relative to what assets they have. So for a long time, I thought Dakota Gold was overpriced and it's finally getting down to the point where I could start to buy it a little bit. I'm not going to aggressively buy at this point because I don't think they have enough in their portfolio, but I am willing to invest some money in this management team at this price and I'll look for a better price to add even more to my position. The next super successful entrepreneur that we're going to look at, he has a few companies, and that is Amir Adnani. And the first company we're going to look at is Uranium Energy Corp. It trades under the symbol UEC. And as you can see, it has run up like crazy over the past few years. Now, if they had added a lot of value in that same amount of time, it might not be so overvalued. Um, now, during that period of time, the uranium price has gone way up, which is a big contributor to the stock price going up so much. But at this current stock price and considering what assets they have, I think it is way overvalued and there's no way we're putting it in our portfolio at this price. The next Admir Nani company that we're going to look at is Gold Mining Inc. So for a while, I thought Gold Mining Inc. was way overvalued. However, I think now, today, we can get it at a pretty good price, and Gold Mining Inc. is definitely going in our portfolio. The next Amir Nani company is Uranium Royalty Corp. Trades under the symbol UROY. And with this, I think today we're getting it at a pretty decent value, so I think we can put this one in our portfolio. Something about Amir Nani is that he has so many companies that he's involved in. He's a CEO, a director, or a chairman in every single one of these. And he's also involved in other companies that you and I can't buy because they're private. My one big holdup with Amir and Nani is I'm afraid he's spreading himself too thin being involved in so many companies. However, I have to admit, the guy knows what he's doing and he knows how to promote his companies and he knows how to run companies very well and apparently can juggle a bunch of different ones at the same time. Normally that's a big red flag, but he seems to be one person who's able to do it. So because he's involved in so many companies, 
I might not put so much money into each one of these as I would invest in some of the other companies that I'm going to invest in. But the next one on our list is Gold Royalty Corp. It trades under the symbol GROY. And of the Admir and Nani companies we're going to be looking at today, this Gold Royalty Corp is the one that I would put the most money in. So that is going on our list. Next super successful entrepreneur that we're going to look at is Keith Newmeyer. He has two companies that we're going to look at. And the first one is First Majestic Silver. The stock price is way down over the last few years. So by that, it looks cheap. But you could make an argument that the company is actually still not cheap because they've had some major problems. However, given Keith's history in turning around mines, I think that they're going to be able to make it work. And also, I think First Majestic Silver will be one of the better performing companies in what I think will be an upcoming bull market in silver. So we're going to put First Majestic in our portfolio. And the second Keith Newmeyer company that we're going to look at today is First Mining Gold. This is a gold development company in Canada. They have two pig projects in Canada and the developers are hated right now. So you look at basically any gold developer across the board and their stock price looks something like this. I think First Mining Gold is very cheap right now, so we're going to put it in our portfolio. And when we get a change in sentiment, I think that this one is really going to take off. The next super successful entrepreneur that we're going to look at today is Neil Woodyer. And the company is RS Mining. So RS Mining currently has two operating gold mines in Colombia, and they have an enormous growth pipeline over the coming years. I think they're going to build out their company to be a million ounce per year producer. And if they're able to do that over the coming five or 10 years, this stock price is going to go crazy. So we're putting RS Mining on our list as well. 17 tips to make money in gold and silver stocks according to legendary investor Rick Rule. First, invest when the sector is hated. When the sector is hated, that means the prices are low. Rick says more people should buy stocks like they buy groceries. For example, you go grocery shopping and a can of tuna is normally a dollar, but this time you go and it's on sale for 50 cents and you buy like 20 cans of it. But then the next time you go back and it's two dollars, well, you don't buy any that time because it's too expensive. But the investors are the opposite. The price goes down 50% and they freak out and sell. And then on the other hand, it, the price doubles and then they're like, oh, I gotta rush in and buy it. And it's a fear of missing out, but more people should buy stocks like they buy groceries. Next is invest in the companies that are run by serially successful people. Rick says that if he only invested with the people who made him money in his 20s, he would have made twice as much money and worked one-tenth as hard. Investing in these companies that are run by these serially successful people, well, that's going to increase your odds of a win dramatically. And who are some of these people? One, the Lundin family. They've had tons of successful companies. Another, Robert Quartermain. Another is Ross Beatty, who Rick says has launched 15 companies in his career, and Rick has made big money on 14 of them. A couple more are Clive Johnson and Robert Friedland. Next is to invest only in tier one deposits or potential tier one deposits. Rick says that small mines have all the risks and problems of big mines, but only big mines can make you big money. So that's why it's really important to concentrate on the big mines. And what is a tier one deposit? Well, Rick likes to define it as 10 million, no, $10 billion in recoverable reserves and in the bottom half of the cost curve. So if you're talking about a gold mining company, for example, that's a company with reserves of about 5 million ounces that produce that gold or that can produce that gold according to the feasibility study at the bottom end of the cost curve. So if the average gold mining company in the world is mining gold at $1,300 an ounce, he wants it to be $1,300 an ounce or less that that mine produces gold at because then it's going to survive the cycle and it's going to stay in production in the low part of the cycle so it can make lots of money in the high part of the cycle. And by the way, in case you don't know who Rick Rule is, 
He's one of the most successful resource investors. He's been in the industry for 50 years and knows it inside and out. So he's definitely someone worth listening to. His next tip is to concentrate most of your money in the biggest and best companies in the world. Who are these companies? These are the ones with the highest margins. These are the ones with lots of tier one deposits. These are the companies that have a long track record of great capital allocation. Ironically, the biggest and best companies in a rip roaring bull market aren't going to go up in price as fast as the less good companies. However, Rick says you can have some of my upside if you take away most of my downside. A couple of these very high quality precious metal companies include Agnico Eagle Mines and Wheaton Precious Metals. Now I'm going to be mentioning a few names in this video, but please don't take this as investment advice and always do your own research before putting any money into any one of these companies. The next tip is to seriously consider the gold and silver royalty and streaming companies. Why? These are simply better companies than your average mining company because they have better margins, they have fixed costs, they have limited downside, but they still get a lot of the upside from increased gold and silver prices or discovery optionality. For example, let's say you have a million ounce deposit and the company spends a bunch of money, the mining company spends a bunch of money exploring for more ounces around that million ounce deposit and they find another five million ounces. Well, the royalty company didn't incur any expense finding that additional five million ounces, but they get all the benefit of it when it's mine and they aren't subject to any of those costs. And all around the world, you're seeing these increased taxes, increased social rents, the government taking a bigger take in these mines and the royalty or stream holder isn't subject to these. So these royalty and streaming companies limit your downside a lot, but also they still perform very, very well when gold prices are going up. But when gold prices are going down, they don't perform nearly as bad typically as the regular mining companies. And by the way, a couple of great royalty and streaming companies include Royal Gold and Franco Nevada. The next tip is to look into the prospect generators like the royalty and streaming companies. This is also a very low risk business model. They're usually run by a very knowledgeable geologist who stakes mineral rights around the world in what they think are perspective areas. And then they do minimal work on that to try to show to other companies saying, hey, there might be something good here. And then they sell those projects to other companies and they'll typically have like these stage payments where they'll receive an upfront payment and then a payment at various milestones and then also a royalty if that ground ever gets into production. So it's a very low risk business model. It takes quite a few years to bear fruits. However, there's quite a few companies like this that have been around for many years and have lots and lots of projects in the works. A couple that you could look into would be EMX Royalty or Altius Minerals. Although these two companies in particular aren't focused on gold and silver, they do have some gold and silver exposure. The great thing with prospect generators is they're using other people's money for almost all of the exploration. It's a great business model, low risk, but you have to be patient with them. Another tip from Rick Rule is to think about the unanswered questions. What type of unanswered questions are there in the company? Let's think about a gold explorer, for example. It's a gold explorer, they're looking for gold and they've hit some mineralization near surface. So the next unanswered question might be, does that mineralization continue at depth? So they know it's at the surface, but is it down here as well? And how deep does it go? Then you think about, okay, how much is it going to cost to get a yes answer to that unanswered question? and how much money do they have in the treasury. So let's say it's gonna cost them $5 million in work and 18 months to get a yes answer and their annual GNA is a million dollars. They're gonna need six and a half million dollars total. But if they only have $2 million in the bank, where's the other four and a half million dollars gonna come from? And if they don't have a realistic way of getting that other four and a half million dollars, they're never going to be able to answer that unanswered question, which would get you a re-rate in the stock price. And when you're thinking about these unanswered questions, you have to think about, okay, if we get a yes answer to that question, how much could the stock realistically be trading for after that yes answer? And if you get a yes answer, what's the next unanswered question and how much money will it take to get that yes answer? 
Something else Rick Rule says is that most investors are way too impatient. And he's had a lot of 10 baggers in his career where he's made 10 times his money on a stock and the typical 10 bagger took five or six years to complete. And it's because they were answering a series of these unanswered questions and they got a yes answer. The stock doubles, they get another yes answer, it doubles again. But in between each yes answer, there might be a year or two. Have some patience with these and be thinking about those unanswered questions and what comes next to build that next step on that value ladder. His next tip is to invest in companies that are very, very careful with their general and administrative expenses. If a company has high GNA, it's likely you can just throw that in the trash pile. And a lot of these gold and silver companies out there are actually totally worthless, or well, they should be totally worthless, and they're actually lifestyle companies. These management teams are raising money just so they can continue paying themselves their fat salary for a couple more years, but they never actually have any intention of developing value for shareholders. So how do you know if GNA is too high? Well, you're going to look at their filings to figure out how much money is going into GNA versus how much is going into the ground. And a pretty good rule of thumb is that no more than 20 or 25% should be going into general administrative expenses and 75 or 80% should be going into exploring for gold. Rick's next tip is to choose those companies where management is aligned with shareholders. So does the CEO own a lot of stock? Rick likes to see the CEO having five times their annual salary in stock or more. And you can ask, how much stock do they own? At what price did they pay to get that stock? Because if they own a bunch of stock, but they got it for like a fraction of a penny when they started the company, well then that doesn't really count. And also try to figure out what percentage of the CEO and upper management's net worth is in stock of that company because if a high percentage of their net worth is in that company, you bet they're gonna be working their butts off day and night to make sure that's a success. And those management teams that own a lot of stock are going to be much more likely to act in the best interest of you, the shareholder, than someone who doesn't own any stock. If they don't own any stock, they're probably going to act in their best interest and not in your best interest. The next thing that Rick likes to know is has this management team been successful at this task in the past. So if, for example, somebody has never had any experience in gold and silver, well then probably don't invest in them. But also, let's say they've had success running a gold mining company in West Africa and now they're exploring for gold in Nevada. Those are two very different skill sets and probably not very relevant to one another. So you want their skill set that they've been successful in in the past to be relevant to what they're doing today. Rick's next piece of advice is that if the reason to own a stock goes away, the stock must go away, you must sell the stock. So earlier I was giving the example of trying to figure out if the mineralization extends to depth, like you know it's at the surface, but is it down here? Well, let's say they drill that and they hit a blank, there is nothing at depth. Well then, in that case, it's probably not gonna be a tier one mine, so you sell the stock even if it's at a loss. It's a lot better to take a 30 or 40% loss than it is to take a 100% loss. And if you're investing in gold and silver explorers, you're going to have a lot of losers. Even if you follow every tip in this video and you research like crazy and you choose the best management teams and the best projects, you're still going to have a lot of losers. So you have to minimize those losers so then your big winners can more than make up for them. Rick's next piece of advice is to call up the CEO and ask your questions directly to him. He says that the best CEOs in the junior mining sector live and breathe their company and there's nothing they like more than talking about their company and are happy to talk with investors about it at any time. So call the CEO and if you can't get a hold of them, well then, that's probably a good sign that it's not somebody worth investing your money in. The next thing Rick suggests is that for every stock that you own, you should spend at least one hour a month researching that stock, not just watching YouTube videos like this, although he says that you should still do that, but he's talking about reading the quarterly filings, reading the annual reports, staying up to date on all the press releases and what's going on with the company. You can find all this stuff at CDAR, this website that I'm gonna put on the screen 
right here. So spend at least one hour a month on every stock that you own. And personally, I think that's too little, but at least one hour a month. The next tip from Rick is that you need to be emotionally and financially prepared to lose money. Like if your stocks go down 50%, you cannot be freaking out because that's going to happen. This sector is incredibly volatile. So you have to be mentally prepared for that and never invest more than you can afford to lose. Like if it's gonna make you lose sleep at night, maybe investing in the sector isn't right for you. But the next thing that Rick says is that too many investors pay too much attention to price and not enough attention to value. The price is meaningless. The price of a stock is meaningless if you don't have an idea of what the value of that company is. And related to that, related to the value of the company, Rick says that you're never going to get it right. You just have to try to get it more right than other investors. As Rick likes to say, a 70 year old fat bald guy will win the 100 meter dash if I'm the only one who shows up to race. So you have to show up, you have to research the stock, you have to try to come to a realization of what the value of that company might be to see if the price makes sense to buy it or not. But if you work harder than everybody else, well then you're much more likely to win. I'm gonna chat with you about why the gold and silver royalty and streaming companies are such great investments. And be sure to stick around until the end because before the end of this video, I'm going to give you one of my picks, one of the companies that I really love right now. As always, do your own research and never make any investments solely based on these videos. The first great thing about these companies is that their costs are fixed and they get all the upside for free. So typically these royalty and streaming companies are making an upfront investment and they're doing this at a price in which they think they'll get a reasonable rate of return if the metal prices stay the same and the reserves don't grow. But over time, the metal prices tend to go up and also the reserves of the mine tend to grow as the mining company invests more and more money in exploration because it's in their best interest to make sure that mine runs as many years as possible. By the way, I'm Jordan from miningstockmonkey.com and I'm coming at you from my home in Querétaro, Mexico. If you're going to invest in a gold or silver company, it's probably because you think the price of the metal is going to go up a lot. Well, in the last five years, the price of gold has gone up from about $1,300 an ounce to $2,000 an ounce. So a $700 increase in the gold price. And what have the gold miners done? Basically nothing. The average miner is pretty much flat over those five years in that period of huge increasing gold prices. So why? Well, let's take Barrick Gold, for example. So Barrick Gold is arguably one of the best gold miners in the world. It's the second biggest, and they have what are probably the best assets in the world. And five years ago, they're all in sustaining costs. What it cost them to produce an ounce of gold was approximately $800 an ounce. Today, that number is about $1,300 an ounce. So the price of gold has gone up $700 an ounce over that period, but their costs have also gone up $500 an ounce. So that's why the stock price has gone nowhere. That combined with their output decreasing a bit as well. And what has happened to the royalty and streaming companies over that same five year period? Well, most of them have gotten their, increased their production. Well, they don't actually produce anything, but increase the amount of ounces they're receiving. Plus, they're receiving an extra $700 an ounce approximately for every ounce of gold that they're getting. So their profits have gone up dramatically while miners' profits have basically stayed flat despite the gold price going up like crazy. So while Barrick Gold stock price has remained basically flat, the royalty and streaming companies have more or less doubled during that same time period. And that's doubling when we're in a really weak market right now, like sentiment is horrible and prices are greatly depressed. So you have doubles despite that happening. If you're enjoying this video, please subscribe to the channel. You can do so for free with the click of a button. Something else that's great about these companies is that they get all the exploration upside for free. For example, a royalty company might pay an upfront payment to get a royalty on a 2 million ounce gold deposit. Well, it's in that operator's best interest 
to grow that resource, to spend money drilling to try to find more and more ounces. So the company producing the gold spends tens of millions of dollars drilling out the deposit, trying to find as many ounces as possible and converts that two million ounce deposit into a four million ounce deposit. Well, that resource doubled and the royalty company didn't have to spend a dime. They got all of it for free. And if you're new to this sector, you might be thinking, well, what are the odds of the resource size doubling? That must be pretty low, right? No, actually, that is very, very common. As you can probably tell, I love these royalty and streaming companies, but even though they have a great business model, you still need to conduct thorough research to assess their benefits and risks. And another reason that I want to own these companies is that something else that's common is road blockades and strikes that get the mines shut down. Let's say a mine gets shut down from a strike or a road blockade. Well, yeah, the royalty t company doesn't get any ounces for a while because the mining company isn't producing any. However, the royalty company doesn't have any costs associated with that. Whereas the mining company still has to pay all their employees, they still have to operate a bunch of equipment, spend a bunch of money on energy. It is very expensive to keep a mine running even if you aren't producing anything. Plus you might have to spend money like dealing with the local community to make them happy so the blockade is removed and the mine can reopen. The royalty company faces none of those costs and those ounces just sit in the ground at no cost to them until they're ready to be mined again. Hey, by the way, could you do me a favor and click that like button if you're enjoying this video because it helps out a lot. In mining jurisdictions all around the world, taxes and social rents on mining have been increasing like crazy. And it's something that's going up and up and up. And like when you're owning a producer, like a gold producer, it's really hard because these taxes and these social rents just keep increasing and it's hard to make any more money even as the prices of the metals go up. Well, when you own a royalty or streaming company, well, these increased taxes and social rents usually don't apply to you. And depending on the jurisdiction, the royalty companies may even get a favorable tax treatment, resulting in a lower tax burden for the investors. Something else that's so great about these companies is investment is they take so few people to run. They're such a simple business. Franco Nevada, for example, the biggest royalty company out there has 45 employees and they have a market cap of over $30 billion. That's nearly a billion dollars in market cap per employee, which might be a record. I don't know of any company that's better than that. And why do you need so few employees at these companies? Well, it's because it's such a great business model and they're so simple to run. Warren Buffett says that he likes to invest in companies that can be run by an idiot because eventually, an idiot will run it. <laughs> but fortunately, in the whole sector, I don't think I can name a single company that isn't run by very smart people. When it comes to gold mining companies, like the companies that are actually producing the gold, you cannot own those through the bear market because you are going to lose your shirt. These companies lose so much money in the bear markets, so you absolutely cannot own them. However, the royalty and streaming companies are a lot better in that sense because you still get a lot of leverage on the upside in the bull market, but then when it comes to the bear market, the stock prices of these royalty and streaming companies typically don't go down nearly as much. And a big plus is that these royalty companies are still making a ton of money in the bear market because their costs are so low. And also, since a lot of the mining companies get into trouble in the bear markets and these royalty and streaming companies have a ton of cash, they can typically pick up royalties and streams on world-class assets for pennies on the dollar, which makes for a great long-term investment. Another great thing about these companies is their diversification. The typical royalty and streaming company owns assets all around the world in many different jurisdictions in various stages of development and production. So it's hard to beat the diversification from your typical royalty or streaming company. Since these companies are so well diversified and they have relatively predictable cash flow, and also they have huge margins, well, they typically have a low cost of capital so they can borrow money at great rates to acquire more and more assets. So if the interest rates are 5% on the 10 year treasury, a great company may be able to borrow at 7% or 8%. Well, these royalty and streaming companies can consistently deploy capital getting 
15% returns over time. So when you can do that, when you can borrow at 8% and get 15% on your money, well, that's a no brainer and a great way to grow the business. There's a number of companies in the royalty and streaming space that I would be comfortable investing my money into and just going sailing around the world for 10 years. Like seriously, these are such great companies run by great, honest people with a great business model. How many times can I say great? Uh, but yeah, because of this, because of all of these attributes, you don't have to watch it every day. You don't have to watch that stock price like crazy. You can just invest your money when it's a good value and then go golfing or fishing and you can not even look at it for years and have a pretty good idea that your money is in safe hands and will be worth a lot more in the future. And because these are such great companies, you're just going to sleep better at night. They may not be super exciting, like giving you 10 full gains in just a few years, although they could if it's a good enough bull market, but you don't need that to become really wealthy. Like if you invest in quality companies like this and you just let your money sit there for years and the earnings and dividends are compounding well you could become a very wealthy person over the years with relatively low risk now of course there's still risk there's risks with everything in life uh, so the risks aren't zero but i think that the benefits and the potential returns greatly outweigh the relatively low risk that you face and speaking of risks the royalty and streaming companies have limited exposure to environmental and regulatory risks that the miners face. Like typically the royalty and streaming companies face much fewer risks from the governments than the miners do. And by the way, most of the things on this list don't just apply to the precious metal royalty companies. They also apply to the diversified royalty companies and also to the oil and gas royalty companies. By the way, after I share with you the final reason to own these royalty and streaming companies, I'm going to share with you one of my top picks, something I think is a great value right now and has a decade of huge growth to come. So stick around for that. The next reason to own these royalty and streaming companies is that when generalists, investors, and institutions come into this sector looking for great companies, they're going to be looking for the biggest and the best that are super liquid. So they're going to be looking for the companies with the highest margins. And when they start looking at the various options, what they're going to come to is the biggest and best royalty and streaming companies. So that's one great reason to own them because they're going to be some of the most certain to move in a bull market but they'll also probably be the first to move. And it's also worth noting that these companies get very overbought and really oversold. Just make sure you're getting in at a good price and you're doing your due diligence. So I told you that I'd share one of my favorite royalty and streaming stock picks with you. And keep in mind, this isn't investment advice. This is just what I'm doing with my own money based on my own research and what I think, what I see as the potential in these metals going forward and also the development and growth pipeline of this company. And the one I wanna share with you is Metalla Royalty and Streaming. So this is gonna be the symbol MTA on the New York Stock Exchange. This company, it has tremendous growth built into it. Even if they don't buy a single other project, they're going to be growing like crazy for the better part of a decade. And then they'll have assets that will last for many decades. Something I like about it is they have quite a bit of exposure to gold, silver, and copper, which are three of my favorite metals, which I think have some of the best outlook in the whole natural resource industry. And today, this stock is trading at $2.85 a share. I think it's a really great value at this price. And this is a company where I'd be happy to invest my money today, not have internet for 10 years, go sailing around the world and come back to it. And I'd be very surprised if that stock price wasn't multiples higher than what it is now. If you would like to know- These are what I consider nine of the very best gold companies. The first company on my list is Agnico Eagle Mine. So this company has a really long track record of being a great operator in tier one jurisdictions and they have tier one assets. So they operate in Canada, in Finland, in Australia. So that's one big appeal to a lot of investors because a lot of the companies with tier one assets have them in places like the Congo, for example. Agnico Eagle also has a long history of paying dividends and they've even paid dividends 
through the deepest of the bear markets, which is unheard of for a gold producer. After a few mergers and acquisitions, they've quickly grown to become the third largest gold mining company in the world. And like most of the companies on this list, they have a very strong balance sheet. But with each company on this list, I'm not only going to give you the perks of that company or the good things about it, but also the risks. One of the risks is that although they have done a great job keeping costs under control, costs have been going up but also because they have such a great track record and have awesome minds in tier one jurisdictions, the company is not cheap. The next great gold mining company is B2 Gold. They also have a long track record of operating very well and also doing what they say they're going to do. Not only what they tell investors they're gonna do, but also what they tell the host countries that they're gonna do. They've been good corporate citizens and that has allowed them to continue operating in what are often difficult to operate places like Mali, for example. They're also one of the best dividend payers in the industry and they have a very strong balance sheet. One big risk with this company is that a significant portion of their production comes from Mali, which is not the most stable political jurisdiction. The next great company is Barrick Gold. This is the second largest gold producer in the world, but they also have significant exposure to copper as well. So the CEO of Barrick, Mark Bristow, is arguably the best CEO in the industry. He took over Barrick a few years back after a merger between Barrick and Rangold before he was running Rangold. Barrick probably has the best tier one assets of any producer and also the very best development pipeline. And in addition to that, they have a strong balance sheet. So what are the risks with Barrick? Well, one is that a lot of their assets are in pretty unstable jurisdictions. Number two, their costs have gone up a lot. In the last five years, they're all in sustaining costs to produce one ounce of gold has gone from about $800 an ounce to about $1,300 an ounce. So usually having great assets allows you to keep costs reasonably low, but their costs have gone up a lot, so that's a big concern. Hey, if you're liking this video, could you please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel because it lets YouTube know that you want to see more videos like this one. The next company is Pan American Silver. So although it has silver in the name, most of their revenue comes from gold. I think it's something like 80%. So they have proven to be a really good operator and the guy behind this company is Ross Beatty, who's one of the most successful mining entrepreneurs in the world, and he still owns a significant stake in the company. So it's always nice to have that really smart, successful guy who's still involved in the company like that. And something great about Pan American Silver is the stock price has really gotten beat up recently. But in addition to that, it has a couple big potential catalysts that could really rocket the stock price. They have a big mine in Guatemala and another big silver mine in Argentina. And with both of them, they're trying to work with the government to get the go ahead for those mines. And if either one of those gets into production, it's going to double their silver production. So what are the risks with Pan American Silver? Well, a lot of their operations are in Mexico and Peru, which haven't been the most friendly mining jurisdictions recently. Next is Osisco Gold Royalties. Because they're a royalty company, they have very low costs and huge margins. And they're also the owner of what's arguably the world's best gold royalty. And based on the sum of the parts, they're probably the cheapest mid-tier royalty or streaming company. So what are the risks with those Cisco Gold Royalties? Well, number one is that they had a great CEO. And recently, he was ousted for no apparent reason. No reason given. Just one day they like let him go seek other employment opportunities. So that was really weird and a big concern. And secondly, they have $250 million in shares in development companies in Osisco Mining and Osisco Development. And if you're gonna invest in a royalty company, I don't know, for me, I don't want all that exposure to a development company. I'm buying the royalty company because it's safe and it's a great business model. So for those reasons, it's a little bit questionable, but it is cheap on the sum of the parts basis. The next great company is Franco Nevada. This is the biggest of the gold royalty companies and they have a really long history of super smart allocation of capital. They're very diversified. They have absurdly low operating costs and enormous margins. They have a rock solid balance sheet and their great assets keep getting bigger. But what's the risk here? Well, because it's such a great company, 
it is not cheap. Next is Wheat and Precious Metals. I really love this company. It's the biggest of the streaming companies. Now they're not as diversified as Franco Nevada, for example, but they still have a lot of diversification. Really smart management who have a long history of making lots of good capital allocation decisions. So you really love to see that. And over time, the share price is just like that, <laughs> going up pretty steadily because their revenues keep growing, their profits keep growing, and they keep reinvesting that money very intelligently. In addition to that, they have a rock solid balance sheet and also they have super high and very predictable margins and cash flow. So what's the risk here? Well, like Franco Nevada, it's not cheap. Next is Royal Gold. Similar to the last two, this is one of the big three royalty and streaming companies. They have great assets, they have great management, they have a long history of a really strong performing stock that just goes like that over time. They also have really low cost and good assets that just keep growing. But what's the risk here? Well, like the others, it's just not cheap. These are really high quality companies and investors know that. So investors are willing to pay a little bit of a premium to get a top quality company. By the way, before I get to the last one on this list, there's a lot of smaller companies that I really like as well. However, to make it on this list, it had to have a market cap of at least a billion dollars. But let me know in the comments if you'd like to see a video like this, but with smaller companies. Next is Sandstorm Gold, which is probably my favorite of the mid-tier royalty companies. They have bought a lot of good assets over time that year after year, they keep replacing everything that's been mined. So despite getting revenue every year, their attributable gold ounces that are still in the ground keep growing. So that's always great to see. They have really low cost, great margins because they're a royalty company. And something else I really like about Sandstorm is they have a great development pipeline. So what are the risks for Sandstorm? Well, the CEO, he's made a lot of good decisions over the history of the company, buying great assets. However, not too long ago, he did something that a lot of investors didn't like for good reason. He was buying back stock with the company's earnings, and then he ended up issuing stock at a lower price. So that wasn't good. And also, after a big acquisition recently, the company has quite a bit of debt. Now, personally, I'm not too concerned about this. I think they're gonna be able to pay it down without a big risk to the company, but that is a risk. After listening to a couple hundred Rick Rule speeches and interviews, these are some of the best ways to guarantee that you lose money investing in mining stocks. One way to lose money is to not know the company well enough to know what could go wrong. I've heard Rick say that if you don't know at least three things that could go wrong with the company, you don't know enough to invest in the company. So make sure you study up on it so you know what you're putting your money into. The next great way to lose money is to invest in those companies where the top management doesn't own much stock. If they don't own much stock, they're not going to be aligned with you, the shareholder, and they're going to be acting in their own self-interest, often like making sure they continue getting paid their salary rather than acting in the shareholder's best interest. The next way that Rick says you'll lose a bunch of money is if you do what a lot of people do, and that is got a hunch, bet a bunch. So just think about how much research you do when buying some consumer good. So for example, right now I'm shopping for an electric razor because as you can see, I need one. Uh, so what have I been doing? I've been reading reviews from other people. I've been comparing my options, comparing the features, things like that. And in addition to that, like after I've decided which one that I want to get, I'm patiently wait for a sale or shop around to try to get the very best price. Compare that to what we do when we go on YouTube and we hear a hot stock tip from some mining stock monkey. We go and put five grand in it that day without researching it at all. Uh, now, I'm not just like criticizing here because I've done this myself. It's stupid, but I've done it because you hear something and it sounds really good and you're like, oh, I need to buy that. It looks like such a great price. And then you get screwed and you lose money because you weren't patient and you didn't research enough and you didn't invest enough of your time into that decision. So if you're going to put a few thousand dollars into a stock, make sure you do enough research to make sure that that's a good investment for you. If you want to lose money, something else you can do is to buy a stock or buy a sector after it has gone way up in price. For example, recently lithium shot up in price like crazy. Tons of people piled in at the top and now they've lost their ass as the price of lithium has collapsed over the past little while. So 
this is a very cyclical industry. There's the highs and there's the lows because high prices cure high prices and low prices cure low prices. What's the reason for that? Because like when the price of lithium goes up, for example, people start to try to find substitutes for lithium so they start using less of it. And also as the price goes up, there's going to be less demand because not as many people can afford it. And in addition to that, the higher prices incentivize more supply. More supply comes online and pushes the prices down. And then the opposite happens when prices are low. This is a very cyclical industry with huge oversold lows and then way overbought tops. And it's the perfect opportunity for a contrarian to come in. Because if you can come in and buy those lows and sell those tops, it's a very inefficient market and it's a way that you can make a lot of money. As Rick says, be a contrarian or you will be a victim in this sector. Another great way to lose money is to invest in those companies where management didn't do what they said they were going to do. So let's say they raise $5 million to drill their deposit that they have to find out more about what's under the ground there. And then they end up spending that money on something else. If that happens, well, maybe it's a good idea not to trust them with your money in the future. This one is counterintuitive, especially for the newbie. But another great way to lose money is to buy when the price to earnings ratios are super low. Like in the general market, it's typically a good idea to buy when the PE ratios are really low. However, here in the cyclical industry, the PE ratios are the lowest when the prices are the highest. For example, a couple of years ago, the price of palladium went crazy and it was way up here in the stratosphere. And those companies producing palladium, like Impala Platinum and Sibanye Stillwater, they had ridiculously low PEs. I forget exactly what they were, but I think it was a, around three, a PE of three. It looked on the surface like a really good investment because, oh my gosh, I'll get my money back in three years. But then the inevitable happened and the prices of palladium crashed. And now in the past two years, Sabanye Stillwater is down 75% and Impala Platinum is down 80%. So that's why it's generally a bad idea to buy when the PEs are super low because that typically means the commodity prices are really high. Because as we learned earlier in this video, in this industry, high prices cure high prices. By the way, if you're finding this video helpful, please click that like button because it helps me know that I should make more videos like this one. The next way to lose money is to hold on to a stock after the thesis that you originally had has failed. Once that thesis has failed, it's time to get rid of the stock regardless of the price. So you buy a stock hoping for good drill results and then the drill results come back and they're terrible. At that point, your thesis, the good drill results has failed and it's probably time to sell the stock. Yes, the stock will be down, but you still have to get rid of it if your thesis has failed. In one interview, Rick was talking about a former client of his and he was going through the portfolio that this guy had and he's like, okay, why do you own this stock? Oh, it was a recommendation from this guy years ago. Okay, what do you know about it? Um, nothing. And he's like, okay, sell that. And the client's like, no, we can't sell that. And Rick said, well, why not? Oh, because I'm way down on it. I'm down like 80 or 90%. And if I sell it, I'll lose that money. And Rick said, no, you've already lost that money. But the question is, what are we going to do with the remaining money? So in the world of investing, if the average stock goes up 10% a year, that's the beta. But the alpha is what you can get above that 10%. And the next way to lose money is seeking that alpha without dedicating an appropriate amount of time to researching those companies. If you don't have that time to dedicate to researching those smaller companies where you're less sure about what the results are going to be, maybe it's better just to take the beta. Like let's say you think gold is going to go crazy in the next few years. Maybe you just want to get the beta by buying the biggest and the best stocks. And in a bull market, those biggest and best stocks well, they have a lot less risk in any market, but anyway, in a bull market, you're still going to get substantial returns for that. So a lot of time just sticking with the biggest and the best might be your best option. Another way to guarantee that you lose money is to sell just because the stock price went down. Now, a lot of times the stock price goes down for legitimate reasons, but then a lot of other times, especially in this sector, the stock price is way down, down 50%, even 80%, just because sentiment is bad or just because the metal price has gone down a little bit. So there can be drastic swings in the stock price 
And those times, assuming nothing bad has happened with the company or there's no major flaws with the company, those times of low prices should be considered sales and a time to buy more. Like Rick says, when you go grocery shopping and that tuna is half price, you buy a lot of that tuna because you're getting a good value there. And you might not get that value for a while, so you wanna stock up. By the way, my name is Jordan and I've been a mining stock investor for the last 17 years. If you would like to know what I'm doing personally with my own money, go to miningstockmonkey.com and sign up for my free newsletter. The next way to lose money is by disregarding environmental and social factors. The last few years, ESG has been all the rage, but the mining industry has known about ESG for many decades because we know that if we don't have the support of the local people, if we don't have the support of the indigenous people, that mine is not going to get built. So it's really important that the company is seriously engaging with the local community. Now, every one of these companies on their presentation will have like what they're doing for ESG, but I mean, a lot of them is just BS, but you have to make sure they're engaging with the community the right way to ensure that that project can move forward with the local support. Another great way to lose money is to have a time mismatch between your personal expectations of how long you're willing to wait before the stock price goes up versus how long it's realistically going to take to get a re-rate in the stock. Like, so let's say a company is going from a developer into a producer. So they're in the phase of building their mine. And that mine build is going to take two and a half years and you have an investment time frame of three months or six months. That's a totally unrealistic investment time frame because to get the whole value out of that build, you need to be willing to wait those two and a half years and maybe even a little bit longer to account for any delays. So if you're pissed because your stock price is down after six months and that mine build was going to take two and a half years, that's not the company's fault. That's your fault for having unrealistic expectations. Your expectations have to match reality. And I get that it's hard to be patient sometimes. Sometimes you just want it to happen faster. But what you want, as Rick says, does not matter. Another excellent way to lose money is to invest based on narrative instead of based on value. So if you invest based on narrative, what other people are saying, oh, this is so great, everybody's making so much money, well then you're going to be investing near the highs of the cycle and then you're preparing yourself to lose a lot of money as you go into the lows. But on the other hand, if you invest based on value, you can look at a company and be like, hey, this company is selling for $30 million, but I think it should be worth $150. So I'm going to invest in this company at a $30 million valuation, and I'm just going to sit here patiently and wait. That's going to make you a lot more money than chasing that narrative, because chasing that narrative typically gets you investing at the top of the cycles, which is a great way to make sure you lose money. So if suddenly, for example, silver becomes super hot and everybody you know is talking about silver and how everybody's going to make so much money investing in silver, well, that's a great sign that it's time to take some money off the table. And because you were invested in value, your bets were already placed on silver before the mania happened. Another way to lose your investments is by not being financially and psychologically prepared for massive declines in your stock prices. When you're investing in a super volatile sector like this, you're going to get 50% drops in your stock prices pretty often, unless you're investing in just the biggest and the best companies. But if you're going down the quality trail at all, you're going to have those massive drops in price. So. Make sure you're mentally One of the prepared. world's most successful commodity investors, Rick Rule, just said that he's aggressively selling puts on Newmont. So in this video, we're gonna go over what that means and look into why he might be doing it. But first, let's watch a one minute clip from this interview where you can see what Rick said about Newmont. Uh, Newmont, I'm increasingly attracted to. Uh, I have objected to Newmont for years in that they have too many tier two deposits and not enough tier one deposits. The recent acquisition of Newcrest by Newmont has led to some weakness in the stock in Newmont. Uh, I always like things that get cheaper, but in particular, it is focused management's attention on selling tier two assets to lower the acquisition cost of Newcrest while continuing to develop 
their joint portfolio of tier one assets. So I think Newmont is moving determinedly in the right direction. Uh, I haven't added to my position in Newmont, but I've been pretty aggressively selling puts on Newmont, uh, either pocketing the put income or having the stock being put to me cheaper uh, than it already is. I'm going to show you what it means to sell a put and how you can make money from doing this. I'm going to put that down in writing here after we go look at a put example. Okay, so we're on the website optionsprofitcalculator.com and we're going to go to a cash secured put. And then we're going to put in the symbol for Newmont. And this is the current stock price, $40.14. Uh, we're going to write it. Uh, writing a put is the same as selling a put. And then we're going to go here and we're going to select our option. For clarity, this is an investment advice and always do lots of your own research before investing any of your hard earned money. And when you're dealing in options like this, it can be very, very risky. So when it comes to selling a put, you could uh, sell one that has an expiration date that's not very long from now at all. Like, for example, here's one that expires in six days or you could go a few months out or as long as a year or two out. So let's click on the one that's January, 2025. So this expires about a year from now. And uh, let's look at the strike price of 37.50. So the current stock price is $40 and 14 cents. So this would be giving somebody the right, but not the obligation to sell you a hundred shares of Newmont at $37.50 on or before January 17th, 2025. And for that privilege, they're going to be paying you the price of this option. And you're going to get that immediately. You're going to get that cash immediately. But whatever you see here, you have to multiply that times a hundred. So it would be $360 per contract that you sell, per put that you sell, you're going to receive $360 immediately. So based on this interview, we don't know exactly which put contracts that Rick Rule is selling, but let's assume that he's selling the one that expires January 17th, 2025 at a strike price of $37.50, which is uh, $2.64 lower than today's closing price. He said he's aggressively selling puts. I don't know what that means, what aggressively means, other than he's doing a lot of them. So let's say he sells a thousand put contracts at $3.60 each. Well, for each contract, he would be receiving $360 times 1,000. So he'd receive a $360,000 deposit. But now let's look at what that means. What could be the results of doing this? So the first option is, if Newmont is above 37.50 when January 17th, 2025 rolls around, then nothing happens. Uh, he just gets to keep the $360,000 that he receives. Well, actually, this is his to keep no matter what happens. But on the other hand, if Newmont is below 37.50, on this date, that option is going to have value to the owner and the owner of those options is going to exercise them, meaning that Rick will be required to buy 100 shares of Newmont for each contract that he sold. So he'll be required to buy 100,000 shares of Newmont at $37.50. So he better have, what would that be? $3,750,000 available to buy his 100,000 shares of Newmont that he's required to buy. And he's going to have to buy 100,000 shares regardless of whether Newmont is at 37.49 or Newmont has gone bankrupt and is trading for a nickel. But he's going to have to pay this price regardless. Now in that interview, he made it seem like he thought Newmont was already trading at a pretty good price where he would want to buy the shares of stock at the current price. And he also mentioned that he's selling puts that may get put to him at a lower price. So 
based on that, we know the strike price he's choosing is below the current stock price. So maybe it's $37.50, maybe it's a $39 strike price, maybe it's a $30 strike price. We don't know based on that interview, but we do know that the strike price is lower than the current price. So I think what he's thinking is that number one, Newmont is already trading at a pretty good price at which he would like to buy shares of. Number two, that he's getting paid a fat premium immediately for selling these contracts to people. And number three is that if it gets put to him, if the price of Newmont ends up being below the strike price at expiration, he'd be happy to own the shares anyway. So that's why he's willing to do it. And he's getting paid a nice sum of money for those people to have the privilege to sell him those shares at a potentially lower price. So basically he thinks it's good value today. And if it gets even cheaper, it'll be even a better value. And maybe those shares get put to him. Maybe they don't. But anyway, he's willing to buy them, whether it's at today's price or at a lower price in the future. But regardless of whether the stock price goes up or down, this 360000 is his to keep, and he can do whatever he wants with it in the meantime. I have heard him say in other interviews that he's holding a lot of cash right now, so he may see this as a way to make his cash earn even more cash in the meantime. So he's setting aside $3.75 million dollars in case he has to buy these shares. So in the meantime, over the next year, maybe he's getting 5% in treasuries on this cash. Plus he can do something with this cash to also earn money on that cash in the meantime. So while he waits, maybe this stock gets put to him. Maybe the price of Newmont goes down over the next year, but he's betting that it doesn't because he's betting that it's already a low price and that a year from now, it will likely be higher than where it's at now. But it's worth noting that these aren't his words, well, no, except what you saw in this video. This is just me trying to get inside of his mind to figure out what he's thinking in terms of selling puts in on new In my opinion, market. Equinox Gold is stupid cheap right now. And in this video, I'm gonna show you why I think it's so cheap, but also they have a lot of debt. And after that, I'm going to talk about whether we need to be worried about that debt they have and how worried should we be. By the way, I'm a shareholder of Equinox. These are my opinions based on my analysis. So don't take any of this as investment advice and always do lots of your own research before investing any of your hard-earned money. Just a few days ago, we got a press release from Equinox saying that they produced 564,500 ounces of gold in 2023, but we don't know the all-in sustaining cost, the AISC, for the entire year. That's what it cost them to produce an ounce of gold. But we do know that for the first three quarters of 2023, it was $1,595. But Equinox is going through a big change right now because they're building the Greenstone mine in Canada. So what this is going to do it's going to increase their production a lot. It's going to add 240,000 ounces of production. But in addition to that, it's going to lower their all in sustaining cost by quite a bit. And third, it's going to improve their political risk dramatically because right now they have operations in Brazil, they have operations in Mexico, a little tiny mine in California. And this is going to be in Canada, which is considered one of the world's premier jurisdictions. So when you decrease your jurisdictional risk, you increase the multiples you're getting. And in addition to that, number four, it makes it a bigger company. It's getting closer to that million ounce producer mark, which is kind of the limit to be considered a major. And as you approach that number, you should see increased multiples as you go from like a junior producer to a mid-tier to a major. So this Greenstone mine, it cost $1.6 billion to build. And they've been building it for a couple of years now. Now it's totally built and now they're commissioning it. So now they have to turn on the mine, put some ore in it, run it, 
test it and make some changes based on the results and then do that over and over and over again until they get it operating just the way they want to. So the full commissioning will happen over a series of months. Now, after full commissioning, it's expected to produce 400,000 ounces of gold for the first five years, but Equinox owns 60% of the mine, so their share is 240,000 ounces. And what about cost? How much will it cost to produce an ounce of gold at the Equinox mine? Well, in the 2020 feasibility study, it said that it was going to average $850 an ounce for the all-in sustaining cost. However, there's been inflation since then. So are we going to be producing at that number? I would guess probably not. So let's go through a series of possibilities to figure out what the all-in sustaining cost might be after the Greenstone mine is fully commissioned and in full production. So if they can hit this $850 an ounce number, all-in sustaining costs at Greenstone, they would be producing 804,500 ounces at 1372 all-in sustaining costs, and this would be company-wide. And this was their all-in sustaining costs for their other mines that are already in production. And this number has actually gone down from 2022 to 2023. It dropped by, I think, about $60 or so. So that number is actually trending down. But in today's video, I'm going to assume that this all-in sustaining cost and this production number stays the same, although I do expect this production number to increase and this to improve a little bit because they've been making some improvements to their mines and they had a mine blockade in Mexico for a while. So that one was shut down for a while, which increased costs. But anyway, let's say that the Greenstone mine comes in producing at $1,000 an ounce. Well, that brings the company-wide all-in sustaining cost to $1,417. So what does it look like if we're here? Well, Gold today is a little over $2,000 an ounce. So if the Greenstone mine is producing at $1,000 an ounce, the company would be making approximately $600 per ounce. And here I have the worst case scenario where the Greenstone mine comes in producing at an all-in sustaining of $1,150 an ounce. That brings the company-wide AISC to 1462. So this is a lot of numbers. But what does this all mean for the company's profitability? Well, down here, I'm gonna show you this. So on the left-hand column here, we have the cost of the Greenstone mine, the all-in sustaining cost. We don't know yet what that number is going to be, but it, the feasibility study said 850. So let's say the average gold price is 1800, and that's company-wide, they're going to be selling their gold for $1,800 an ounce. So that would have to go down quite a bit from where the gold price is at today. This is, this is the worst case scenario. Of course, it could go lower than that, but this is the worst case scenario for this example. If gold is $1,800 an ounce and Greenstone comes in producing at $850 an ounce, the company is going to have cash flow of $344 million a year. But like worst case, Greenstone comes in at a high cost, 1150, which would still be their best mine, by the way, uh, because all of their other mines have a higher cost than that. So if Greenstone comes in producing at 1150 and the average gold price is 1800, well then the company will have cash flow of 272 million dollars a year, and compared to the market cap today, that is a 5.2 times cash flow multiplier. So even in the worst case scenario, after Greenstone is fully in production, we have a pretty low cash flow multiplier indicating that the stock is pretty cheap. So now let's say the Greenstone costs come in at $1,000 an ounce and the gold price for 2024 is $2,000 an ounce. They're going to be making $469 million in cash flow per year after the Greenstone mine is in full production it, and it will take a little bit for that to happen which would put the cash flow multiplier at three times, the company trading at three times future cash flow. Now let's say we have a pretty high gold price in the coming year and the average price of gold is $2,500 an ounce and Greenstone costs come in at the low end of 850. The company would have a cash flow of $907 million a year 
So that's a cash flow multiplier based on today's market cap of 1.6. So based on this, and considering Equinox has some of the biggest reserves of any mid-tier gold company out there, well, I think Equinox is very cheap today. However, they have a lot of debt and we have to have to look at the balance sheet and when that debt is going to come due. And also they have some convertible notes so we could see some more dilution as well. So now let's take a look at that and see how big of a risk that dilution is and how big of a risk that debt is. So I expect the upcoming cash flows to be somewhere in this range here. This $2,500 gold is kind of just for fun, just to give you an idea of what it could possibly be, but most likely scenario is somewhere in here. But now let's look at the debt they have and see what kind of cash flows what they will have to pay that upcoming debt. So this is pretty rare to see. They have a revolving credit facility that funds most of their long-term debt. And that has an interest rate anywhere from 7.8% to 9.8%, and that's $692 million. So they're paying a significant chunk in interest every single year that that isn't paid down. So they need to pay that down fast. And then they have convertible notes of $451 million, none of which are in the money right now, and today's closing price was $4.45, but they do have 137 million of those coming due in just three months. And those convert at 525. They're convertible at 525 into shares. So if the share price is below 525, those are out of the money. And the owners of those notes are not going to convert them into shares. However, if the stock price goes above that, well, then they're now in the money and the owners of those will convert them into shares. So since that's only a few months away and the stock price would have to go up 81 cents from today's price to be in the money, we will probably see Equinox have to pay the principal balance on that, which is 137 million. Well, right now in cash and marketable securities, they have 315 million and they do have more than 137 million in cash. So they do have enough cash to pay that in April. So that shouldn't be a problem if the stock price is below 525 when those expire. But keep in mind, if the stock price goes above 525, well then those are going to be exercised and we will get some dilution. There will be a share dilution. However, Equinox will receive a bunch of cash from that if they're exercised because the owners of that are going to have to pay $5.25 per share and that cash would help them to pay down this debt. So you have that revolving credit facility of almost 700 million and then you have 451 in convertible notes. You add those together to get the total amount of debt. Everything except this, the 137 million, is considered long-term debt in that it's due more than a year from now. But to get the net debt, you then have to subtract the cash and marketable securities for a net debt of 828 million. Now, when you see that they have debt of 828 million, these multiples over here that we talked about earlier start to make more sense because basically they would have to use that cash flow to pay down debt. And then after we pay down debt, we should see these multiples increase. So considering as of September 30th, they have 192 million in cash, they should easily have enough to pay this upcoming payment of $137 million due in April if the stock price stays below 525. And going forward, should the gold price stay somewhere around where it is, and I, I think 2000 is kind of looking like the new floor and it's struggling to go under that now before that was resistance and now it seems like it's the floor so, but going forward if the gold price stays around there equinox should have somewhere between about 450 million and 500 million dollars in annual cash flow compared to the market cap today of 1.3 billion however we could potentially see them adding another 71.8 million shares. Currently, there are 313 
million shares. However, we could see a potential expansion of shares because there's a few options out. But the big thing is these convertible notes. They could be converted into shares if the stock price of Equinox goes up. Now, these are all out of the money right now. So if the stock price stays where it's at, none of these are going to turn into shares. However, I expect that we will get a significant re-rating in the stock as we decrease the all-in sustaining cost of the company, as we improve its political jurisdiction by a lot, and also we get closer to that million ounce producer mark. But in addition to that, we're going from Equinox spending $1.6 billion to build this greenstone mine to have it generating cash. So now we're not outlaying that money every single quarter, spending lots and lots of money to build that mine. Now it's going to be bringing in cash, which should mean a re-rating in the stock, especially considering how great of a mine it is in one of the world's best jurisdictions. And it's producing a lot of ounces at a really good price. So I think we're going to see a significant re-rating in the stock. And although they do have a lot of debt right now, I don't see it as much of a concern. This video, I'm going to share with you seven reasons why I no longer buy options on mining stocks. And if I ever deal in options, I am a seller. The first reason I no longer buy options are the fees and the enormous spreads that you have to pay. Make no mistake that the spread you're paying is a fee, even though it isn't directly taken out of your brokerage account. I'll explain that in a minute. One stock that I'd be interested in buying right now is Pan American Silver because it has a couple potential catalysts. Number one is the silver price. I think the silver price has potential to go very high very quickly uh, for various reasons that I'm not going to get into in this video, but I could do a separate video on it if you want me to, let me know in the comments below. But anyway, a second potential catalyst for Pan American Silver is their mine in Guatemala. They have a huge silver mine in Guatemala that they're trying to get approval from the Guatemala government to reopen. This is a past producing mine. The infrastructure is still built. So when they get approval to reopen it, they're going to be able to do so pretty quickly. So you have the silver price and that Guatemala mine that could potentially give the stock a huge re-rate and make the stock price go way up. So if I were going to buy options on a stock, which I'm not because I don't buy options, Pan American Silver would be one that I would consider because it has a couple potential catalysts coming up. So let's look at the call options available for purchase. So I'd want some time for the catalyst to play out. So here's these options with an April 19th expiration date, which gives us 129 days, a little over four months. When I'm looking at which option to buy, I generally want one with a large open interest where it says OI. So the $20 strike price has an open interest of over 10,000 contracts. So that might be the one I would want to look at because typically when they have a higher open interest, the spreads are lower and also they're more liquid. So they're gonna be easier to sell with lower spreads. $20 strike price expiring April 19th, 2024. So if I buy one of those contracts, I have the right, but not the obligation to buy a hundred shares of Pan American Silver at $20. So if the stock price goes way up and it goes to $30, well, I can buy 100 shares for $20. So that's where the value is in this. So if you get a fast run up in the price, well, then your options price can increase like crazy. The bid for this is 20 cents and the ask is 25 cents. So to find the price that you're actually going to pay for each contract, you have to multiply that times 100. So you'd be paying 100 times the ask, which is $25. And at least with Schwab, my brokerage account, I pay a 65 cent fee per contract. So if I want to buy 50 options at 25 cents, I'm looking at $1,250 on which I'm going to be paying a fee of a little over $30, but the fee isn't the really big deal. The really big deal is the spread because the bid is 20 cents. The ask is 25 cents. There's a 20% spread there. So let's say I'm buying a thousand dollars worth of options contracts. I'm going to be paying the ask or $25 per contract. And if I wanted to immediately turn around and sell those, I'd have to sell them at $20 per contract. So I'd be losing 20% immediately. And that money is going straight to the banks. It's going straight to the market makers. And you have to pay that spread both when you buy it 
and when you sell it. Now, sometimes you can get lower spreads if you're in a super liquid stock and there's a ton of action happening in those option markets. Well, sometimes the spreads aren't so bad, but almost anything in the mining sector, something like this is pretty typical. So that's one big reason why I don't like buying options is because it's just enriching the banks. So if I think a stock is going to go up in price, I tend to prefer buying the stock rather than buying an option. A big reason why I like doing that is because I'm getting paid while I wait if it's a dividend payer. So the longer I wait, the more dividends I'm collecting. Whereas if I buy an option, I'm not collecting any dividends. And also time is on my side when I own the stock. Whereas when I own the option, time is working against me because every single day that passes, some of the time value of that option is disappearing. So if the stock is staying flat, I'm actually losing money when I own an option. So a third reason why I don't invest in options is because I find it stressful with that time decay working against you every single day. I find myself watching the stock prices like a hawk and I hate doing that because I think my time is better spent doing other things. It makes me focus a lot more on the price, which I don't like to do because most of my investments are longer term investments. And that puts me in a shorter term mindset and it's stressful for me. And I feel like when I get into buying options, it puts me more into a gambling mindset when I like to invest based on fundamentals. The next reason is that owning a junior mining stock is already like owning an option, but it's like owning an option that doesn't expire. Why is it like owning an option? Because the sector is already so freaking volatile. For example, one stock that I'm really high on right now is Equinox Gold. Today it's trading at $4.59. They're working on building their massive greenstone mine in Canada, which is going to reduce their political risk a lot. It's also going to increase their number of ounces they're producing by quite a lot. And also it's going to lower their all in sustaining cost company wide tremendously because the Greenstone mine is such a great mine. It has this huge catalyst. And I think after investors see a full quarter of production from Greenstone, if the costs are reasonable, which I think they will be given who's operating it, well then I think we're going to see a huge re-rate in the stock. And I see this easily being a $10 stock. When it goes from $4.59 to $10, that's more than double in less than a year. I don't need options. Like that is a gigantic return. This isn't investment advice. This is just what I'm doing with my own money based on my own analysis. But I think that's a really good play. Now, could I leverage that? by buying options and making even more money. Yeah, but I don't need to, to make tremendous returns. And if I chose to buy options instead, well, that's increasing my risk tremendously. Investing is all about weighing risk versus potential reward. I think if I were to buy options on Equinox instead of buying the stock, well then I'm increasing my risk by a lot. And I don't think the potential reward outweighs that increased risk. By the way, if you're finding this video helpful, please click that like button because it helps out a lot. Now also there could be delays with the mine build. There could be delays getting it operating at full capacity. There could be delays with getting the metallurgical recoveries that we think we're going to get from that mine. If I buy an option, all of these delays are risk. However, when I own the stock directly, that's like owning an option that doesn't expire. So if there are any delays, if it takes them longer to get to full production, if it takes them longer to recover all the metal that they want to recover, well then I can survive a few extra quarters because I own the stock. I'm not fighting against the clock with that time decay from the options. And that kind of leads me into my next reason why I don't buy options on mining stocks. And that is because Murphy works overtime in the mining sector. I forget who that quotes from, but I think it rings very true. What can go wrong will go wrong. And what you don't think can go wrong will go wrong. There's always delays. There's always problems. And when you have that time constraint that an option puts on you, well, then those delays kill you. Whereas when you own the stock directly, 
you can handle those delays if you're patient. And by the way, my name is Jordan and I'm releasing new videos on mining stocks almost every day, so please subscribe to the channel. The next reason I don't buy options on mining stocks is because of taxes. If I'm lucky enough to time it correctly, and if I'm lucky enough to make a big enough gain to offset those gigantic spreads and still make a good amount of money, well then I'm subject to paying taxes at my marginal tax rate. And if I'm buying a stock and holding it for longer than a year based on the US tax code, I get a greatly discounted capital gains tax rate for my long-term hold. But I don't get that with options. So I end up paying a higher tax on any capital gains that I get from options versus any capital gains that I get from stocks. And by the way, this market is so hard to time and with options, you really need to get the timing right. Now, even if you see a clear path forward, like let's say a company is building a mine and you think that stock is going to re-rate at the end of the mine build after investors see a full quarter of production from that new mine. Well, so many delays happened. Murphy's working overtime to make sure that everything can go wrong, will go wrong, and it can cause a lot of problems that eat away at that time left on that option, which makes you lose money every single day and lose money with every delay. The seventh reason I don't buy options in mining stocks is that in my experience, buying options almost always results in a loss. Now, the only time, well, I've had some successes with options, but the only more consistent successes I've had is when I've bought long dated options. Like I saw a clear path forward for a company where it was going to re-rate after a certain event. And I bought options that expired well after that. So it gave plenty of time for any mistakes. It gave plenty of time for anything that went wrong to be fixed. And they could get that new mine operating at full capacity before my option expired and be able to see a full quarter of production in the financials before that expired. So I did this with Fortuna Silver Mines, for example. I bought options that were a year out or two years out when they were building a mine. And I thought we were going to see a big re-rate in that stock after that mine was built and in full production. And we did. It happened just how I thought it would. There were some delays, but it more or less happened how I thought it would. At the end of that, I did end up making a lot of money on those options. However, I would have made almost as much money just buying the stock instead. And I would have done so with a lot less risk. When if you found this gets really hyped up, you typically see gamblers coming in and overpaying for calls in hopes of making huge returns in the bull market. Well, I am selling them those calls. And in this video, I'm going to show you how I'm making a hundred percent annualized return selling covered calls on the uranium producer Cameco. Because as we speak, uranium is shot way up in price and we're starting to see those people come in overpaying for these calls. Okay, so here's what I did. I bought 100 shares of CCJ, that's Cameco, for $4,387. And I immediately sold one call or one contract and one contract equals 100 shares. So basically I'm selling somebody the right but not the obligation to buy a hundred shares of Cameco on or before a certain date at a certain price. So that date is January 12th, which is 16 days from the date at which I sold this call. So the person buying the call only has 16 days to exercise the contract. And the strike price was 44. And when I bought the shares of Cameco, the price was $43.87. So I'm giving somebody the option, but not the obligation to buy 100 shares of Cameco from me for $44 each on or before January 12th. So what do I get in return for this? Well, I immediately receive in my brokerage account $138.34 after fees. So that is a 3.15% return in 16 days. And in the meantime, the stock can go up a little bit from $43.87 to $44 before I'm gonna be forced to sell my shares. So what happens next? Well, this $138.34 is mine to keep no matter what. This is the options premium 
that the buyer of the option paid minus any brokerage fees. So over the coming days, the stock price will fluctuate. It will go up and it will go down. But what matters is where it's at on the day of expiration. Because typically, the owner of an option will never exercise that option while there's still time value left on that option. So they won't exercise the option or buy the shares from you until the last day. Now, sometimes it can happen differently if there's like a dividend coming up or something like that, but almost all the time it's going to work like this. So if CCJ Cameco is below $44 at expiration, I'm going to keep the 100 shares. And remember, I have this $138.34 that was immediately deposited in my brokerage account the moment that I sold that option. And the other alternative is CCJ is above $44. And in that case, the owner of that option is going to exercise their right to buy those shares at $44, in which case I must sell them to that person for $44. And in that case, I'm going to pocket $4,400 from the sale of those shares. And I still have this $138 that I received from the sale of that option. And what I'm describing here, what I'm doing, it's called a covered call. And it's covered because I own 100 shares of Cameco. I'm not selling any rights for people to buy shares from me that I don't already own. So for every one contract that I sell, I have to own 100 shares of that stock for it to be a covered call. Now, technically, you could do this without buying the shares first, but then you're selling something you don't own. And in that case, you're increasing your risk a lot. And if the stock price runs way up, well, you're going to have to buy those shares at the much higher elevated price and sell it to that person who bought that option. As the late Daniel Drew said, he who sells what isn't hisn must buy it back or go to prison. But in the case of covered calls, you're not selling what isn't hisn because you own the shares, right? When I employ the strategy of selling covered calls, I like a few things to be happening. One, I like it to be in a hot sector because when the sector is hot, you typically have gamblers coming in who are overpaying for these calls. Number two, I typically like it to be a more volatile stock because the higher the volatility, the higher the options premiums are. And number three, I'd like it to be a stock that I want to own anyway, because if the stock price goes down, well, I'm going to be stuck holding that stock. So if it's a stock that I would have bought anyway, I'd be happy to buy it in order to sell a covered call. By the way, if you find videos like this helpful, please hit that like button so I know to make more like it. Okay, now I'm gonna show you a tool that I like to use to calculate what type of profits you can make from these option sales. So I go to optionsprofitcalculator.com. And then here I click covered call. And then I'm gonna put in the symbol. And then it's gonna automatically get me the current price. And keep in mind, the numbers will be different than what I just showed you because there has been a day of trading in between. So this is gonna be changing every single day. So right now, the cost to buy 100 shares would be $4,326. And then you're going to write the call. Write is the same as selling a call. And selecting the option. So it's currently trading at 43.26. So I'm going to select one that's a little out of the money and the same January 12th expiration that I bought. So this is going to be 15 calendar days from now at 43.50. I'm going to click the mid between the bid and the ask one contract and a lot of numbers are going to show up here. So I like this website to show me how much I could possibly earn from selling that call, and also at what point is my break even? So for example, here, um, if the stock price at expiration is at 43.50 or above, I'm going to earn 3.5% in 15 days. But if it's below 43.50, well then you can scroll down here to see how much 
your total profit would be on that. And the break even point on this one is right around $42.10. And keep in mind, we're buying this, we're buying the stock at $43.26. So as long as it's above $42.10, you're still making money. So the stock can actually go down in the next 15 days and you can still make money because you got that option premium. So why would somebody buy this option? Well, they're getting the right to part of the upside of the stock. So for example, if the stock went all the way up to $45 in the next 15 days, you would still only make 3.5% on your money. I say only, but that's a significant return in 15 days. But because they bought that option from you, they get to keep the difference between the strike price, 4350 and where the stock is at, $45. I started investing in mining stocks. One huge mistake I was repeatedly making is that I was viewing company press releases as important news updates, informing me, the investor, of important things that are going on with the company. But that is not how press releases should be viewed. Make no mistake that every single press release you read from a mining stock company is a sales pitch trying to get you to buy their stock. Now, when you view the press releases through that lens, it's much easier to make an informed decision as an investor of what you should do with that stock. Now, today I want to give you an example from a company that had this press release earlier in the year. Now, I think this particular press release demonstrates pretty well of what a company will try to do when they have really bad news to share. So let's take a look at this from Silvercrest Metals. So this is actually what I consider to be one of the better companies in the junior mining space, but you'll even see this with the good companies in the space. Silvercrest announces the results of an updated independent technical report. And no matter how bad the news is, they always start off press releases, we are pleased to announce blah, blah, blah. So you'll see that all the time. You'll see like, we are pleased to announce blah, blah, blah. And then it'll be the worst news the company has ever released. Now, you shouldn't blame management for this because it is management's job to make their company look as good as possible. And it's our job as investors to sift through the BS and realize what's good news and what's bad news. What they do here in this press release is a pretty common thing. It's what I call a shit sandwich. They'll start off with good stuff, then they'll put the shit in the middle, and then they'll end it with more good stuff. Here we have the updated technical report highlights. Robust production profile with strong NPV of $550 million at base case. Okay, that's, that sounds pretty good, right? Okay. Strong cash flows, debt-free, healthy balance sheet. All good, right? However, this should set off a red flag because this is about the technical report highlights. And what does debt-free and healthy balance sheet have to do with a technical report? Nothing. Okay, we're going to have free cash flow of approximately this for 23 to 29. Okay, that has to do with the technical report, but this part has nothing to do with it. Silvercrest has paid off its debt and has accumulated treasury assets balance of $59 million. Okay, that's good, but it has nothing to do with the technical report highlights. Report details supported by current operational performance. And then this goes on to say how they've completed more than 16 kilometers of underground development, and they've actually been mining to determine this. And so before you start mining, you have an idea of what you're going to mine, and you spend a lot of money, you spend millions of dollars on these technical reports, like the feasibility study, to determine your mining method, what's in the ground, what's the best way to extract that. But no matter how much money you put into it, that's always just a guess. Now at a feasibility study level, it's a pretty educated guess. However, you don't really know what you have until you actually start mining. So that's what this is saying. So the details of this report are supported by actual mining. And then you get to the updated mineral reserve estimate. So the last mineral reserve estimate was uh, the 2021 feasibility study. They say the updated proven and probable mineral reserve estimate of 78.6 million ounces silver equivalent is a 13% reduction from the 2021 feasibility study. And keep in mind that they've been doing a lot of drilling in the past two years since that uh, 2021 feasibility study. So 
they should be growing the reserves significantly, not reducing them. They say this reduction incorporates the updated gold to silver ratio, updated modeling for narrower and more widely dispersed veins than originally modeled, and then increased cutoff grades due to several reasons. So this is the super important part, the horrible news that so far they've buried under what seems like pretty good stuff. But so now they realize the veins are narrower than they thought. So they thought the veins were like this, but they're actually like this and they're more widely dispersed. So they thought they were like this, but they're actually like further apart, right? And then increased cutoff grade. That's the really nasty news right here. Okay, but it's a simplified underground production plan. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Uh, and then metallurgical recovery is improved. Okay, that's pretty good as well. We always like to recover more of the metal, right? But then here's another piece of bad news. Higher sustaining capital reflects increased costs and expanded mine footprint. The life of mine sustaining capital has increased by 77.5%. That's a lot of increase in expenses. And then they end it with a couple more good things. Okay, but it's still the lowest quartile all in sustaining costs. And there's immediate and longer term growth opportunities. Immediate growth will be targeted through a $10 million exploration program focused on targeting 40% of the inferred mineral resource for conversion to measured and indicated mineral reserve. So there's a lot of uh, mining jargon in here. And the more reports like this you read, the easier it will be for you to understand this. But what you have to look at here is it's really bad news. They started off with good stuff. They put the crap in the middle and then they end it with stuff that sounds good, right? And then here's a quote from the chief operating officer. The results from the report confirm our confidence in Las Chispas. You know, I'd prefer they, they didn't do this. I would prefer that they write the press release saying, not we are pleased to announce, but we are disappointed in the updated technical report because unfortunately we had to decrease our reserves because the veins are narrower than we thought and they're spread further apart than we thought. But you know what? They're, it's not all bad news. We have better metallurgical recoveries. Uh, we have a simpler underground production plan now. And also we're debt free. We have a healthy balance sheet. We have we still have a strong NPV despite having to do this. But no, that, that's not what they do. What they do is they try to make it sound as good as possible and they bury the bad news between either good news or stuff that sounds good. And then the CEO states, the recent lease of the results from the report is a significant milestone in the latest of a long list of de-risking events for our company. I mean, yeah, it is de-risking because you're actually mining now and it's not just guesswork like it was before you started mining. However, this is really bad news. This is nothing against the management of Silvercrest Metals because it's their job to make bad news look as good as possible. And it's our job as investors to sift through the BS and realize what's good news, what's bad news, and what we should do with our own stock and our own purchasing decisions based on this news. And despite what they tried to do, how they tried to make it look better, the stock was down 25% this day. Now, would it have been down more if they just said, hey, we're disappointed to announce the results, but we still have some uh, signs of light here and there's still very good things about this project? I don't think so. I don't think it's going to make a difference. But, you know, this is, this is what almost all the company is doing. We as investors have to deal with it. So, the point I'm trying to make is always view press releases as a sales pitch, and you'll be much better off making your investment decisions. I believe decisions. that I've identified a gold development company that is a huge takeover candidate. In this video, I'm going to share what that company is, why I think they're such a big takeover candidate, and who the most likely companies would be to buy them out. In order for a mid-tier gold producer or a major gold producer to buy out a smaller company, they typically want that company's permits to be fully in place and have that project fully permitted. Why? Because if they don't, 
then they have to start much of the process all over again. It's not that they have to resubmit paperwork. However, when a new bigger company comes in, the local community is like, whoa, what, what's going on here? No, we had a deal with this company. We trust those guys. Those guys have been working to build up our community for the last five years. They've been building schools. They've been teaching the kids. They've been building roads and bridges. No, we trust them. We don't trust you. So then like a lot of the process has to start over building relationships with that community if the takeover happens before the project is fully permitted. Bluestone Resources is a Lundeen company, part of the Lundeen family. A couple of years ago, they had a fully permitted mine. They had a fully permitted project. However, as they did more drilling, as they talked about it more, they're like, this is going to make a lot more sense as an open pit mine than as an underground mine. So we can double our resources and we can triple our NPV if we change it to an open pit mine instead of an underground mine. However, the problem was Guatemala had only permitted an underground mine, not an open pit mine. So they had to redo their permit applications and resubmit their permit applications to get an amendment to that permit to allow the open pit mining. And when they did this, a lot of people were saying, Guatemala will never approve an open pit mine. I mean, haven't we learned over all these years to never underestimate the Lundin family's ability to work in difficult locations and to work with governments to get difficult mines approved? Those who underestimated them were wrong. Once again, we just got notification that that amended permit was approved for an open pit mine. So what makes Bluestone Resources such a great takeover candidate? Well, I think they're the perfect takeover candidate for a mid-tier. I think the mine is a bit too small for someone like a Barrick to come in. They're going to have a 14-year mine life to start, but that will expand over time as they drill more, explore more, and expand those resources. And over that 14-year mine life, the company is going to average almost 250,000 ounces of gold production with that heavily weighted towards the front end. So you get a lot of production the first few years. So this would look really, really good to a company that's currently producing 500,000 ounces of gold a year, a million ounces of gold a year. This would make a meaningful difference to their production profile. And you know what? It's 250,000 ounces a year at a very low cost. According to the most recent feasibility study, we're looking at an all-in sustaining cost of just $650 an ounce, which is crazy low in today's environment. Now, we've had some inflation since then, so maybe that number will be a bit higher. But I mean, for a feasibility study, a recent feasibility study to show that, well, that is incredible. Another reason why they look like a takeover candidate is because they have a market cap of less than $50 million. And this Cerro Blanco mine in Guatemala is going to take more than $500 million to build. So when you see a mine that's going to take more than 10 times the market cap of the company to build, usually that needs to be built by a bigger company. But this is a Lundin company. And if any company can arrange financing, it's going to be one that's part of the Lundin group. But the market cap relative to how much it's going to take to build that mine is definitely a big reason why this is a potential takeover candidate. But in addition to that, one huge reason is this press release in July of 2023. Bluestone announces strategic review process. Bluestone today announced the company has commenced a process to explore and evaluate potential strategic alternatives to further advance the Cerro Blanco Gold Project and the Mita Geothermal Project. These alternatives could include, among other things, the sale of part or all of the assets of the company, a sale of the company, a merger or other business combination with another party, or a strategic transaction. Bluestone has successfully advanced the Cerro Blanco Gold Project through several technical studies, unlocking additional value through an open pit development scenario, which effectively doubled the gold resource ounces and tripled the projected project returns. As outlined in the 2022 feasibility study, the Cerro Blanco Gold Project is a robust, rapid payback, high-grade operation. However, as a single asset developer, 
with no operating revenues, safeguarding capital, shareholder dilution, and value is a top priority. A larger company or entity with cash flow could be more appropriately suited to maintain and advance the Cerro Blanco Gold Project and Mito Geothermal Project over any future development timeline. The Cerro Blanco Gold Project is currently permitted as an underground mine. Now it's permitted as an open pit mine as of today. As part of the strategic review, alternatives could include, amongst other things, a sale or part of all of the assets of the company, a sale of the company, a merger or other business combination with another party or strategic transaction. The company has not set a timetable for this process, nor has it made any decisions related to any strategic alternatives at this time. There can be no assurance that the exploration of strategic alternatives will result in a transaction. The company does not intend to provide announcements or updates unless or until it determines that further disclosure is appropriate or necessary. During this time, the company will continue to pursue the approval of the permanent amendment for the Cerro Blanco Gold Project. So right there in that press release, they're essentially telling us, we intend to sell this company and we won't give any updates until the process is done. Well, today's news that the open pit project has been approved and is fully permitted now makes the sale of this project way more likely and very likely for it to happen more quickly as well. So now let's talk about the potential suitors for Bluestone Resources. I see the most likely company to buy Bluestone to be Lundin Gold. Lundin Gold has said publicly that they're looking for an acquisition. By the way, this is one of the companies in the Lundin group of companies, just like Bluestone is, and they built a huge gold mine in Ecuador that nobody thought they were going to be able to build. And now that gold mine is gushing cash and Lundin Gold has been one of the most successful miners in the entire industry. And they're looking for a great place to put that cash. And who knows Bluestone better? And who knows that Cerro Blanco project better than the Lundins? Nobody. Nobody knows it better than the Lundins. And if that isn't enough, the Lundins actually have a history of taking one of their companies that's actually mining right now and using that cash flow to buy another one of the companies in the Lundin group of companies. They did this recently with Lundin Mining and what was it? Jose Maria in Argentina. Lundin Mining was cash flowing. They have operating mines around the world and they bought another Lundin company, which is a big copper gold project in Argentina. And now we're in a similar scenario in which Lundin Gold is producing significant cash. They're already operating in Latin America, so it wouldn't be that big of a stretch to go to another Latin American company and build a mine there. And they have the cash that would be needed to build that mine without any dilution at all. So I think the most likely buyer of Bluestone Resources would be Lundin Gold, but also you have a company like Equinox Gold. Ross Beatty is the founder and chairman of Equinox Gold, and a few months back in an interview, he said that Equinox is looking to expand and they've been kind of held back from doing anything for two years as their massive greenstone mine in Canada gets built. I, I certainly know opportunities. You know, we're always looking for, you know, smart deals with Equinox Gold. I'm always thinking that it's been something that I've done all my life. I've been a ton. I've done a ton of merger and acquisition work in my career. A ton, you know, like dozens and dozens of deals. The thing about mining that people always have to remember is it is a declining industry every single minute. The actual mining industry depletes its reserves every second. It's a non-renewable industry. So companies must either discover or buy in order to maintain their production or even increase their production. So it's inherently got a lot of m and work intrinsically in it. And the other reality is scale does matter these days. It matters more than it's ever mattered. That's one of the fundamental reasons I, I did a lot of M&A to build Equinox Gold quickly, because scale 
is important. You have more, more liquidity for investors. You have better multiples. You have better access to big capital pools, the ETFs, for example, yeah. large investors. So there's all sorts of reasons why it makes sense today. And, and that's what often also drives M&A work, is the one and one is three. If you can put two companies together, each of which has you know high overhead, for example, put them together instantly. You got a better multiple, and you get rid of all those wasteful uh, overhead costs you can have one instead of two. So it's really sensible if it's a true synergistic merger. The problem is a lot of them aren't. A lot of them are growth just for growth's sake, which is stupid. Or, uh, or you know, and, and quite frankly, I made a bad decision in, in one of our deals to buy a company. When when Equinox combined with Leogold, we got stuck with a with a mine that was much more difficult than I had ever anticipated in Mexico, the, the Los Filos mine. And that's been a real headache. So we, we're sorting it out. It'll get sorted out. But it, it was definitely not the easy, you know, one on one is three deal that I hoped it would be. Uh, and, and so sometimes things happen. They don't always work out. But Getting bigger is smart by itself. And so I expect you're going to see some deals. Is that sort of the, still the plan? Like, let's it's, bring stuff up and go yeah, before for, we look at anything else? Well, um, or looking we, we, I, can that. Say, I can say that uh, we are so confident Greenstone's over the hump now. Uh, I've been frozen out of doing anything for two years while that's all happening. We had to make sure. Like, that was so important to get right. And we now feel very confident that is now right. So we can start looking at other opportunities. There are great opportunities in the space. But, of course, we have to be constrained by all kinds of things. But, I mean, I just want, you know, my ambition with Equinox is pretty simple. It's to build a world-class, like, senior gold producer fast and and get those multiples and get that higher valuation and get... Uh, and, and and build a build a really big company that has humongous uh, leverage to higher gold prices. That's been the mission of the company, pure and simple, since day one. So far, so good. Uh, we just have to. We've been penalized for two years with all kinds of worry about Greenstone, whether we were going to blow our budgets and take longer. As soon as the confidence in the market. Uh, is is there that we have actually met our, our targets and it's, it should be like this month or next month right now. I think we're going to have a, a better price and all of a sudden we're going to have opportunity to do, to do other things if there's the right Once value. Once the penny drops sort of the market the realizes drops. like yep. okay as you said yep. they're over the hump. So they're, this they're month, there. next month it, you know soon it, I yeah. don't know exactly when it's going to be but but definitely if there's a really good opportunity we'll, okay. you know, we want to see in, it. In the Americas? You're going to stay yeah we're going to stay in the Americas yeah I'm not well, about Africa, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for example. He said, after that mine is built, we can look to do another transaction again. And this is an America's focused gold producer, North America, South America, Central America, and Bluestone Resources have their project in Central America. So that fits perfectly in with that. It would add an average of 250,000 ounces of gold to Equinox's already big growth profile, which they're definitely looking for. And you know what? Ross Beatty said after the Greenstone mine is built. Well, guess what? The Greenstone mine just finished being built. So I think Equinox is another company that could be a potential suitor to take over Bluestone Research. One big mistake a lot of mining stock investors make is relying way too heavily on the metric of the market cap versus ounces in the ground. So, for example, one company might be trading at $15 per proven ounce of gold in the ground, whereas another company might be trading at $80 per proven ounce in the ground. Now, that's a big difference, but I think that is a very unreliable metric to use when evaluating mining stocks. And in this video, we're gonna get into a number of the reasons why. In the world of mining stock investing, you'll often hear mining stock promoters talking about how cheap their stock is. And let me tell you, their stock is always undervalued, no matter how cheap or expensive it actually is. But one of the reasons they'll give to justify or why they'll tell you it's such a great buy right now and why it's so undervalued is they'll say, look, our market cap relative to how many proven ounces we have in the ground is super low. For example, they might say, hey, we're trading at $7 per proven ounce of gold in the ground, whereas our average competitor is trading at $30 per ounce in the ground. So by this metric, we should be four times more valuable. So you should buy our stock because it's such a great price. However, there are almost always good reasons for trading at a lower dollar value 
per ounce in the ground. And in this video, I'm going to go over some of the reasons why some companies traded a higher valuation per ounce in the ground, and while other companies traded a much lower valuation per ounce in the ground. So you can get an idea of what kind of deposit the company you're interested in is looking at and how good or bad that deposit is. Now, that's not to say this is a useless metric because it can give you a pretty good idea of what sentiment is in the overall sector. For example, if one deposit today is trading at $15 per ounce in the ground, and in the past in a bull market, a similar deposit has sold for $75 per ounce in the ground, well, that might give you an idea that you might be able to expect a five times or so upside in a nice bull market. And also, this metric is pretty good for comparing one company to another company because if one company is trading at $10 per ounce in the ground and another company is trading at $100 per ounce in the ground, with this information, you have a pretty good idea that one company, the one that's trading at $100 per ounce in the ground, is sitting on a very valuable deposit, whereas the other company trading at $10 per ounce in the ground is sitting on a deposit that isn't very valuable even though the one that's trading at $10 per ounce in the ground might have a lot more ounces than the other company. It's also worth noting that just because a company is trading at a low dollar amount per ounce in the ground does not mean that it's a bad investment. As a matter of fact, a lot of investors in this space seek out those companies because in a rip-roaring bull market, those ones that are trading at a lower dollar value per ounce in the ground tend to have more upside because it's a more mediocre project, generally speaking. Okay, let me give you a quick example here. So you have one company that can produce gold at $1,800 an ounce, so that's a pretty mediocre deposit, and then you have another company that can produce gold at $1,000 an ounce, and that's a pretty darn good deposit. So today, gold is trading at approximately $2,000 an ounce. That means when in production, this company could potentially be making $200 an ounce. So $200 of profit per ounce produced, whereas this one has much better margins and they're going to be making $1,000 per ounce produced. So this is going to be overall the much better deposit. So that's why this one might be trading at a much higher valuation per ounce in the ground. But there are many other reasons that I'm going to get to. But I just want to show you why a uh, less good deposit has more leverage to the price of gold. So now let's say gold goes from $2,000 an ounce to $3,000 an ounce. Well, assuming their costs stay the same, instead of $200 an ounce, this company is now going to be making $1,200 an ounce. So a 50% increase in the gold price means a 600% increase in this company's profits. Whereas over here, instead of making $1,000 an ounce, they're making $2,000 an ounce at a $3,000 gold price. So a 50% increase in the gold price resulted in a 100% increase in their profits. So this is the main reason why a marginal deposit can have much better upside in a bull market. However, they're much more risky because in a bear market, now, it goes from having very little value to having no value at all very, very quickly. So now let's go over some of the reasons why companies' valuation per ounce on the ground can vary drastically. Number one is grade. So let's say one gold deposit has five grams per ton gold and another deposit has half a gram per ton. Well, the first one has 10 times the grade. So that one's typically all else equal is going to be a much more valuable deposit. The next thing to consider is the strip ratio. So the strip ratio is how much ground do you have to move that doesn't have gold in it to get to the ground that does have gold in it. So for example, if you have a high strip ratio where you have to remove 10 tons of ground to get to one ton of ore, well, that's going to be very expensive. Whereas another deposit might have a strip ratio of one to one, meaning you only have to move one ton of worthless ground to get to one ton of ore, and that's typically going to be much cheaper. So something you might want to look at is the strip adjusted grade. So for example, if you have a gold mine that's five grams per ton, however, they have a strip ratio of five, well, you adjust that down to one gram 
per ton because they have to move five tons of worthless material to get to one ton of good material. Another reason for the differences in valuation is the continuity of mineralization. For example, if you're drilling a porphyry copper discovery and you drill a hole a kilometer deep and you have mineralization all the way through and then you drill another one and it's pretty much the same and another one and it's pretty much the same, well, that's very easy to predict what that's going to look like and you can be pretty confident that between each of those drill holes, the mineralization is pretty similar. However, if you drill here and you hit something good, but then you drill here, 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 and hit nothing, and then you drill over here and you hit something good, well, that's going to be something that's going to reduce your valuation because it's a lot harder to predict and it's a lot harder to understand. And also there can be complicated vein systems. Things like that can make it more expensive to figure out what you have, to figure out how you're going to build a mine. And it can make the mine more complicated, which brings me to my next point. The complication level of the mine that could potentially be built is going to make a difference in the valuation. For example, an open pit mine where the grade is really consistent throughout, well, that might garner a bigger premium than some other mine where the grade is very inconsistent. Another thing that's going to affect the valuation is the stage of resource development. For example, there's the Preliminary Economic Assessment, the PEA. And to get a PEA, you don't have to have drills very close together. Your drill spacing can be pretty far apart. But when your drill spacing is further apart, that means there's less assurance of what's in between. So a company at a PEA stage may have a much lower valuation than a company at a feasibility study stage. So there's three main stages, the PEA, the pre-feasibility, the PFS, and then the feasibility study. As you progress through those stages, you're typically going to get a higher valuation per ounce in the ground because the results are more certain and a lot more money has been put into those studies to determine exactly what is under the ground. Another thing that's going to affect the valuation is the jurisdiction. So for example, if a mine is in South Africa, well, that's a really unstable political jurisdiction, so it's probably going to get docked a lot by investors on the valuation. Or if it's in Canada, that's a more stable jurisdiction, that's probably going to garner a higher valuation. And something else that's important about jurisdiction is not just stability, it's how long is it going to take to permit this thing? So for example, if you have a mine in West Africa, well, those countries tend to permit projects pretty quickly. Whereas if you have a mine in Canada, that might take seven years to get permitted. If it's in many places in the US, that may never get permitted. So is it permitted or not? Can it get permitted? And if it can, what is the probability that it does get permitted? If it is permitted, well then those are going to get a much higher valuation. If it's not and people think it will get permitted, that will get a pretty high valuation as well. And if investors think it can't get permitted, well, that's going to get a very low valuation because what is a million ounces of gold in the ground worth if you can never extract it? And something else that's important about the jurisdiction is the geopolitical stability and the tax regime stability. How much of the profits is the government going to let you keep? And are they going to change the rules after you already put all that investment into the ground? Because when you spend a bunch of money building a mine, it's not like you can take those assets and move them somewhere else. That's money that's invested permanently. So you really want a stable geopolitical jurisdiction and one with a stable tax regime so you can calculate how much money and profits you're going to take home into the future. Whereas many of these developing countries have a pretty unstable tax regime and they may say that you're going to be taxed at a 20% cut and that they're going to take a 5% royalty or something like that, but then they change the rules after you invest all your money and then they're like, no, we're gonna double the royalty, we want a 10% royalty and you're paying 30% in taxes or something like that. So that's a really important factor as to determining what kind of valuation a company and their resource is going to get. And something else that is important for development companies, those going through the PEA, PFS, feasibility study stages, and also in the process of building the mine and trying to get permitted and things like that, is do you have the support of the locals? 
because if you don't have the support of the locals, if you don't have the support of the stakeholders, that mine is not going to get built. And what is a mine worth that's not going to get built? Well, probably zero. So let's say a company has a permitted project. It's fully permitted, but something else investors need to know is, is that project financed? And if it's not, what are the odds that it's going to get financed? A project that's already permitted and financed is going to receive a much higher valuation per ounce in the ground than a company that is not. And in addition to that, like if they don't have financing, does the market do investors think they can get financing? For example, if a company only has a market cap of $100 million, but they're trying to build a mine that's going to cost $500 million, five times their market cap, well then, what are the odds that that company is going to get financed to build that mine? Well, maybe it's pretty low. And in order for that mine to get financed and built, maybe it needs to be built by a bigger company. And if investors think that that company isn't going to be able to get financing, well, then they're going to be discounting that project a lot for that financing risk. Another thing that's going to affect the valuation is infrastructure. So you may have a great deposit, but if that deposit is 300 miles from any type of civilization and to get in and out you have to go in by a snowmobile or helicopter or something well that is very very expensive whereas if you have a project that's let's say two kilometers away from a mine that's already been built and they already have a mill that is going to need feed well that one is going to be valued at a whole heck of a lot more per ounce in the ground than the one in the middle of nowhere all else equal because if you have to build 300 miles worth of roads and you have to build a power plant and you have to build power lines over hundreds of miles and all this infrastructure that doesn't exist and you have to build everything well that can get very expensive really quickly and thus reduces the valuation of your project and something else to consider is the size of the deposit is it a big deposit and does it have lots of exploration upside so for example you might have a million ounce gold deposit over here and a 2 million ounce gold deposit over here. But over here, we've already found the limits. What the hell is, why are there balloons? So you might have a million ounce gold deposit over here and a 2 million ounce gold deposit over here. But if you've already found the limits of this one and you have not found the limits of this one and the 1 million ounce gold deposit has a ton of exploration upside. So let's say it's a VMS style deposit where those tend to come in clumps and like there'll usually be a bunch of VMS style deposits together and you've drilled out one of them and you have a million ounces there. Well, then the market might think, hey, this could be a 5 million ounce, a 10 million ounce deposit because it might be a series of 1 million ounce deposits. So the more exploration upside you have, the better valuation you're going to get. And also the size of the deposit. Investors tend to prefer really big deposits because big deposits tend to deliver good surprises and smaller deposits tend to deliver bad surprises. And those companies with huge deposits tend to have a lot of great news coming out of them over the years. Something else to consider is the local labor force. So are you trying to build a mine in a place that already has a lot of mining around? Because if so, there's going to be a lot of experienced labor around there who knows how to operate a mine. However, if you're building a mine in a country that is brand new to mining, well, then you're not going to have any experienced labor and you may have to fly in and out people who do have that experience. And it's probably going to be pretty expensive to train new people there. So the labor force can actually be a big factor as to what kind of value that deposit is going to have. And another thing is, does management have experience and do they have relevant experience so for example if the company wants to build a mine and the management team has built lots of mines successfully in the past well then the market is probably going to believe that yes that management team can build this mine successfully too whereas if it has a management team that has never built a mine well then the market is going to greatly discount that because that increases the risk a lot and another important factor is metallurgy Metallurgy, metall metallurgy. And another important factor is metallurgy. So is it easy and cheap to recover the gold that's hosted in that rock? Or is it going to be very expensive and you may only get low recovery? So can you recover 95% of the gold or can you only recover 50%? And what kind of processing facility 
do you need to process that? And how expensive is that going to be to build? And how expensive are the inputs going to be to extract those metals from that ore? Now, this can get really complicated, and I don't even come close to having the knowledge to understand all of this. So that is one reason why you need to invest in competent management, management who has done this successfully before, because there's a lot of stuff in this that is really difficult to understand. Even if you've been investing in the sector for many years, there is no way that you have the knowledge and the expertise in all of these different sectors when it comes to mind building, the engineering, developing like the model of what is underneath the ground based on the drill holes and what kind of mine is going to have to be built and how is that going to be processed to recover the gold and things like that. So it can get very complicated very quickly. But if you invest in management teams who have history of doing all of this successfully, who have hired the right people to determine how to build the right mine and how to mine it in the most effective way possible, well, then you're going to have a much better chance of being successful investing in this industry. And overall, the single biggest thing that's going to affect the valuation per ounce in the ground relative to the company's market cap is how much is it going to cost to extract that metal from the ground. Now, if you're building a gold mine and you can extract it for $500 an ounce, that's super cheap and that's going to be a very valuable mine. However, if you have a deposit and it's going to take you $2,500 to extract an ounce of gold, well then at $2,000 gold, you can't make a dime. So the price of gold would have to go way, way up to make it worthwhile at all. And even then, it will still be a mediocre mine. Our commodities investor Jim Rogers describes his investing style like this. He just sits back and does nothing until he sees a pile of money in the corner. And after a pile of money appears, he goes and picks it up. And today, what we're seeing with Franco Nevada is the closest thing I've seen to a pile of money just sitting in the corner since I bought Cameco a couple of years ago. So Franco Nevada is the best gold company in the world, so it doesn't go on sale very often. And when it does, historically, it's been a very good time to pick some up. Franco Nevada owns approximately 400 assets, and the largest of which is the Cobre Panama copper mine. It's a huge mine down in Panama. Well, it was almost exactly a year ago, they got some news from the Panamanian government threatening to shut down the mine. They thought they got that resolved. And then pretty recently, the mine has officially been shut down. And because of this mine shutdown, the stock price is down about 30%. But this doesn't make any sense because the entire net asset value of Cobre Panama only accounted for about 15% of Franco Nevada's entire net asset value. So in worst case scenario that they never see another dime from the mine, you would expect that the stock would only be down about 15%, but it's down 30%. But that worst case scenario is actually highly unlikely. So let's talk about why that is. We're gonna go a little deeper in a moment, but let's just think about this on the surface level of how likely it is that the mine stays shut down when it's extremely important to the Panamanian economy, this mine alone contributes like 5% of the country's entire GDP. <laughs> and it's one of the biggest employers in the country, and it's one of the biggest tax revenue generators in the country. And in addition to that, if it stays shut down, it turns from one of the biggest tax generators to one of the country's biggest liabilities. So in what I think is the unlikely event that the Panamanians and the government says, to hell with the economy, we're gonna keep this mine shut down. Well, then what happens? Well, first Quantum, the operator of the Cobra Panama mine, has already filed both a local and international arbitration. And according to various analysts looking at past instances like this, Panama would be subject to paying a huge amount of money to both first Quantum and to Franco Nevada, although that could take several years to play out. But this is all assuming that the mine doesn't get permission to restart. So the mine only accounts for 15% of the company's NAV. The company's stock price is down 30% because of this. And it's very likely that at some point the mine will restart. And if it doesn't, it's also very likely that Franco Nevada receives a significant sum of money from international arbitration. But in addition to that, it's a lame duck government coming up here. It's the president's last term in office. 
So they have elections in May. Since this is such a big employer and huge tax generator, and it's been the center of a big controversy, this mine is going to be a pretty large issue in this upcoming election in May. When a new government comes into office, I don't know if it's probable, but it's certainly possible that they work with First Quantum to get the mine back in production on agreeable terms. Maybe that does happen, maybe it doesn't, but if it doesn't, well, we're in the same position we are right now. So I'll be right back. I gotta go pick up this free money in the corner. Yesterday, we got some huge news for Franco Nevada shareholders that the market totally ignored. So this is going to affect, if this happens, this is going to affect Franco Nevada, this is going to affect uh, First Quantum, and this is going to affect Barrick Gold. So the stock price of First Quantum was way up on this news. The stock price of Barrick Gold dropped a decent amount, and the price of Franco Nevada is basically flat since then. So Franco Nevada has been unaffected by this news, but this could be huge for the shareholders of Franco Nevada. So what is this? Well, Franco Nevada's single biggest asset is the Cobre Panama copper mine, their gold stream on the Cobre Panama copper mine that recently got shut down. And Barrick Gold is very interested in owning huge copper gold projects around the world. So it's no surprise that Mark Bristow, the CEO of Barrick, is considering buying First Quantum. Because, so when first, when that Cobra Panama mine got shut down, after that, First Quantum is basically insolvent because they have a ton of debt and their big cash cow now suddenly disappeared. So, they, they need someone to take over them or, or find some big solution and Barrick Gold buying them would be a perfect solution. Now, I'm going to read this article and after that, I'm gonna tell you why it's so important that Barrick takes over First Quantum and is the one negotiating for the reopening of that mine because they're going to do such a better job than First Quantum for the reasons that I'm going to give you after we look at this article, but let's take a look at this. So, Barrick Gold has spoken with some of First Quantum Minerals' major investors to gauge their support for a potential takeover. After the sudden closure of its flagship mine left the Canadian copper producer reeling and wiped out more than, its, more than half of its market value, Barrick CEO Mark Bristow approached some of First Quantum's largest investors late last year, according to people familiar with the situation, who asked not to be identified as the talks were private. It wasn't immediately clear if Barrick has made a fresh approach to First Quantum, and there's no guarantee that it will make a formal offer. However, it makes perfect sense that Barrick would buy First Quantum, given, given their history of turning around mines that have been shut down. Gold giant Barrick has been seeking to expand in copper, and a deal with First Quantum would transform the company into one of the world's biggest producers, because that First, that first Quantum mine, Cobra Panama mine, is one of the biggest copper mines in the world. The smaller Canadian miner has been left vulnerable after Panama ordered the closure of his biggest and most profitable asset, creating a potential opportunity for Bristow, an industry veteran with a history of building and running mines in challenging locations. But not only that, not just building and running mines, but also getting mines reopened that have been shut down by the government. Bristow has been closely monitoring the situation since First Quantum's problems escalated in October, one of the people said. The CEO said he is confident that Barrick could resolve the situation in Panama as well as run First Quantum's African mines, the people said. Yeah. And I, I totally agree, based on his history that I'm going to tell you about. And keep in mind that uh, Franco Nevada's share price is, is down like 30% because of the closure of that mine. First Quantum's biggest shareholder is the Capital Group with 22%, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. Uh, China's, don't know how to say this, copper company owns 18% and is among those who have been approached by Barrick, the people said. Spokespeople for Barrick didn't respond to requests for comment. First Quantum declined to comment 
Well, this Chinese copper company didn't immediately respond to a request for comment outside of regular office hours. First Quantum has long been on the radar as a potential target for the world's biggest miners, in large part because of the company's Cobre Panama mine is one of the newest and biggest copper operations. The industry's key players are all seeking to expand production of the metal that is essential to decarbonizing the global economy. And Mark Bristow has made it very clear that he wants to acquire big copper projects. And the Cobre Panama mine is, or well was, producing 2% of the world's copper supply. And it was set to double its production. It was set to expand its production by 100% in the coming years. So that would make it 4% of the world's copper supply. Yet the Panama project has also proved to be the company's biggest vulnerability. Cobre Panama became the focus of widespread protests after the government approved a new multi-decade operating contract and the company was forced to stop production because it couldn't acquire or couldn't access supplies. Panama Supreme Court subsequently ruled that the law governing the operating license was invalid, prompting the president to order that the mine be closed. First Quantum share price collapsed as a result of the turmoil, shedding more than 60% of its value last year. The company is currently worth about $6 billion, while Barrick is worth about $31 billion. Yeah, uh, First Quantum has a lot of debt, lots of expenses, and they're not going to be able to survive this uh, if they don't get some big deal done. Bristow has been looking to transform Barrick, formerly the world's biggest gold miner, into a major copper producer. Well, he's looking to transform it into a major copper gold producer because a lot of the biggest gold mines in the world are actually copper mines, where it's a copper gold porphyry system. They're gigantic systems, uh, so you mine both the copper and gold at the same time. The company is building a big mine copper mine in Pakistan and previously made an informal takeover approach to First Quantum that was rebuffed. Bristow has made a name building mines in some of the world's most challenging places. At Rangold Resources, he built projects in Mali, Ivory Coast, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, successfully navigating social and political unrest. When Barrick bought Rangold, uh, Bristow was appointed CEO of the combined company. An offer from Barrick would pile more pressure on First Quantum's management as the company struggles to find a solution to the sudden closure of its biggest profit generator. The situation has raised questions about the company's balance sheet, with billions of dollars in debt maturing in the coming years, and First Quantum has said it will release a plan in the new year outlining how it intends to manage without the mine. Okay, so now let's talk about why this is so important to Franco Nevada that Barrick takes over First Quantum. So Mark Bristow is arguably the best CEO in the industry. So for starters, he created Rangold from nothing. And he built up Rangold to be a major gold producer and one of the few very one of the very few gold companies that did well in those deep bear markets. Now after he built up Rangold, he successfully negotiated a no premium merger between Barrick and Rangold, where he became the new CEO of the combined Barrick. You know how hard it is to do that, to convince the management of their other company to let you run their company? Like these people want to continue getting paid their salaries. And <laughs> Uh, so that's why you typically don't see no premium mergers happen because the management wants to continue getting their salaries and they often don't have the shareholders best interest in mind and they have their own best interest in mind. But, uh, but Mark Bristow made that happen. Now, after he made that happen, he also negotiated the combination of Barrick's assets and Newmont's assets in Nevada and created Nevada gold mines. And guess what? He negotiated it so he would be the operator of it. And that is something that the previous owners hadn't been able to do in decades. Mark Bristow made it happen in like a year or two. And then he had a mine in Tanzania that got shut down. 
he was able to rene renegotiate with the government and get the community support to get that mine reopened in Tanzania. And then they had a big mine, the Porterer mine in Papua New Guinea get shut down. Well, this one, these negotiations took like three years, but guess what? He did it again. He got that mine reopened. Now, based on his track record, do I think he'd be able to do the same thing in Panama? Absolutely. And if he can get, if he can take over first quantum, I think the odds of that Cobra Panama mine getting reopened sooner skyrocket, which would be huge for the Franco Nevada shareholders. So that's, that's the huge news that the market totally ignored when it comes to Franco Nevada. They didn't ignore it when it comes to first quantum, the first quantum share price is way up, but Franco Nevada share price is flat since this news. Today I'm showing you how you can make 25% on your money in a very short period of time, almost every single year. And this isn't according to some mining stock monkey. This is according to legendary resource investor, Rick Rule. I saw an interview from him a while back. It has to be at least a couple of years ago now, so I couldn't go find it because I have no idea which one it was. But in this interview, he was saying that when he was younger, he was doing this almost every single year, every single year that he could, he was buying these companies that had been beaten down from tax loss selling and then they tend to quickly rebound and he was able to consistently make big gains on those purchases now i don't remember exactly but i think he said he consistently made something like 20 or 30 percent a year doing this now he can't make these kind of returns anymore because his portfolio is way too big and the best stocks that have the best potential returns in tax loss season aren't liquid enough for someone with a portfolio of tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. However, for normal people like you and I, we can still make great returns doing this. So in this video, I'm going to show you how. And before the end of this video, I'm going to give you a few examples of stocks that have great tax loss potential right now. And in case you aren't familiar with tax loss selling and what US tax laws are, well, let's say you have a thousand dollar loss on a stock that you have not yet sold. Well, if you sell that stock, you can deduct that thousand dollar loss from your taxable income, and then you can buy that stock back 31 days later. And as always, this isn't investment advice, it's just what I'm doing with my own money, and always do your own research before investing your hard-earned money. So every year, as the year is coming to a close, I'm talking to my tax attorney, and I'm talking to my accountant, and we're talking about ways that I can save money on taxes this year, and this happens with a lot of people. So someone might be talking to their accountant in December, and the accountant says, hey, you're gonna owe a lot in taxes. Uh, do you think you could harvest like $100,000 in tax losses? And the person is like, yeah, I can certainly try. Let's say it's a person who's a high income earner who's living in California. So they're at the top of the federal income tax bracket. And also they have the high state income tax from California. Well, they're gonna be paying like 50% taxes on any income. So let's say they harvest $100,000 in tax loss. Well, that's gonna save them $50,000 in taxes. So when it comes time to sell these stocks, they typically have to sell them pretty fast so they can't be too picky about price. And this is all to get a big savings on taxes so they typically don't care much about the price. So for these reasons, the prices in November and December of especially illiquid stocks can drop precipitously due to tax loss selling. And when the stock doesn't trade a lot, when it's illiquid, for example, I was looking at Bluestone Resources. I was watching that and one day it traded like $10,000 worth of shares and the market cap was off by something like $2 million in that day for $10,000 in trades. So when you have that kind of illiquidity, it can drop the price like crazy with very few shares exchanging hands. And now let's look at a few examples of stocks that could be picked up for a huge discount right now and perhaps make really good returns within just a few months. Okay, so the first example I have for you is Bluestone Resources. It trades over the counter. Uh, with the ticker BBSRF. This one is trading at about 14 cents right now. It has gotten absolutely decimated. There haven't been any news updates with this stock for a while. I think there's a ton of potential with it. People got bored with it and then people were selling because of that. And then also it sold off even more for tax loss season. So I think this is one that has a lot of potential as a good tax loss pickup. By the way, when you're buying shares of stock in something like Bluestone, 
when it's not very liquid, you have to have to place a limit order. Never, ever use a market order. So when you're going to go in there, you're going to go place a limit order. I'd usually try to split the bid and the ask, or sometimes I even put in a stink bid that's below where the bid is at. And when that person goes to call their broker and they're like, hey, give me uh, $50,000 in tax losses or give me $100,000 in tax losses. That broker is going to sell no matter what the price is. So maybe you will get filled, maybe you won't, but it's important to get a really good price, at least in my opinion. And with a stock like Bluestone, keep in mind that it doesn't trade a lot of volume. So you have to be patient with this. And if you are placing an order of a decent size, well, you may be the one who's creating the market. So maybe it takes a few days or a couple of weeks for your whole order to get filled. And if it doesn't all get filled, no big deal because you didn't lose anything. Next is Adventist Mining, uh, trading over the counter with the ticker ADVZF. Also a stock that doesn't have a lot of volume each day. So be patient with it. And if you're placing an order of more than a few thousand dollars, you might have to wait a few days to get filled. It's been destroyed. It had a little run up here, but it's pretty much back down to where it was in the beginning of November. Uh, great pickup right here, I think, and I think it's a great buy for tax loss season. So th these these two, I am owners of both of them. And then I have two more to show you of ones I'm looking at, but don't own yet. Next is Silver Mountain Resources, AGMRF over the counter. So this one has a lot more volume than the other two. So this one, it's gonna be easier to get filled, uh, especially if you're coming in with more money, but also this one, has been destroyed as well. So I think this might be a good tax loss pickup. And next is America's Gold and Silver trading under the ticker USAS. I'm also not an owner of this one, but I'm looking at it because I think it would be a great pickup for tax loss season. This one trades much more volume. This is the most liquid of the four, so you'll probably have no problem getting filled unless your order is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. But Anyway, yeah, th these are four great options that I think have a lot of potential for tax loss season. At some point in the not too distant future, we're going to be seeing massive gains in gold and silver, but how do you know when it's time to sell? What do you do when the prices go way, way up? There's no one right answer for everybody, but in this video, I'm gonna tell you about how I'm thinking about this, what my plan is. I think that in the US, we're going to see some periods of very high inflation coming up. I think it's going to be something like the 1970s all over again, except this time the country is in much worse financial shape. So this time I think it's more or less impossible to raise interest rates to the point where they would need to be raised to, to get inflation under control. And I don't think that the people in control are going to do that. I don't think they're going to have the willpower nor the support of the people to raise interest rates to where they need to be. So I think for that reason, inflation is going to get out of control in the US. Now, because of that, there's no telling how low the dollar can go. And when talking about gold and silver in terms of dollar prices, there's no limit to how high it can go. Let me give you an example. Like if you look at the gold price in terms of Argentinian pesos over the last five years, the gold price is up 14 and a half times. So what would the gold price look like if it went up 14 and a half times from here? That would be over $29,000 an ounce. That's already happened in Argentina. It's just, they're using a different currency than us. So since there's no telling how low the dollar can go, the price in terms of dollars could be insane. It could be like $300,000 an ounce. That doesn't mean that the $300,000 would buy you what $300,000 would buy you today, probably not even close. However, when there's no limit to how low the dollar could go, there's no limit to how high the price of gold and silver can go. And I think it's very likely that at some point in the future, we're gonna be talking about massive numbers. So we need a way to stay grounded because we have to remember that the dollar is just a floating abstraction. It keeps losing value. It's lost something like 99% of its value over the last hundred years. So how do you stay grounded and really know what the actual value of your gold and silver is? Well, you can compare it to some things that have a long history of comparison. For example, there's a piece of real estate that I really like right now that cost about 250 ounces of gold. I think at some point in the future, a piece of real estate like that one might be 50 ounces of gold or 25 ounces of gold or something like that. So when you can track the price of other assets, not in terms of dollars, but in terms of the number of ounces of gold it takes to buy that asset, 
you can have a pretty good idea of when the gold price is going higher versus those other assets. Something else I'm gonna be looking at is the Dow Gold Ratio. So you can look at this ratio going way back. For example, in the 1930s, the Dow Gold Ratio got as low as about two, meaning it took two ounces of gold to buy one unit of the Dow 30. In 1980, it got down to almost one ounce of gold bought the Dow. Will that happen again? Who knows, but it is a good mechanism to determine how valuable your metals are compared to other financial assets. So right now the Dow is at about 37,000 and gold's a little over 2,000. So that puts the gold Dow ratio at about 18 ounces, meaning it takes 18 ounces of gold to buy one unit of the Dow. But when the price of these things that you own go way, way up, you're gonna be feeling really smart and you're probably gonna be thinking, I can't sell because what if it goes up even higher? And it will, it will go up more because nobody sells at the top and you can't think that you're going to be smart enough to sell at the top either. So I think selling a little bit here and there is going to be a better plan for most people than trying to time the market and sell at the top and selling when we're at the peak of the mania, the peak of the bubble. But it's gonna be hard to fight that urge, to to fight that greed, like, no, I can't sell because the price has gone up like crazy and it's gonna go up another thousand dollars tomorrow if I sell today. You cannot be thinking like that. You have to be thinking, what's the value of this compared to other assets? Did I buy low and am I selling high? Is the value of this one ounce of gold pretty high relative to other assets right now? And if the answer is yes, well, then you can feel good about selling some of what you have. Now, I think before this is all over, we're going to get into a mania phase. We're going to get into some kind of bubble. And this is when it's going to be really, really hard psychologically for you to sell because your friends and neighbors and family are going to be telling you about all the money they've made in gold and silver and how you should buy some too. And then you get an Uber and your Uber driver is gonna be talking about gold and silver. And then you're gonna turn on the news. There's, there's gonna be something about how much the gold price has gone up. And then it's gonna to go to commercial. And then you're gonna see some advertisement trying to sell you an overpriced coin. You may even hear about people taking on debt to buy gold. Your favorite celebrity might start endorsing uh, some company that's selling gold on TV. These are the kind of things that happen in a bubble. And people will say, this time is different. It's true that there will be things that are different about the world. However, all bubbles look pretty much the same. If you take a step back to see the forest through the trees, it's pretty easy to determine when it's a bubble. Now, some of you might have this idea that you're never gonna sell your gold and silver. You're going to pass it down to your kids and your kids are going to pass it down to their kids and it's always going to stay in the family. I don't think there's a problem with that. Like it's going to hold its value over time. However, if we get into a bubble phase, which I think we're going to get into at some point, you have to sell a bubble just because that one ounce of gold will buy so many other assets compared to what it buys today. So I think that if we get into a huge bubble, you'd be a fool not to sell some of what you have and exchange that for other assets that aren't so high in price. Just remember the first rule of investing that you probably ever learned is buy low and sell high. When it comes to thinking about when to sell, I'm gonna be looking at these ratios of how much gold does it take to buy real estate? How much gold does it take to buy the Dow? And maybe I sell my first tranche, my first portion of the metals when that ratio when the Dow gold ratio gets to like six, for example, instead of 18. Maybe at that point, I'll be looking at lightening my load a little bit. Now I don't plan to sell it all at once and I don't do that with stocks typically either. I think a better idea is as you see that value of gold and silver increasing versus other assets, maybe you sell your first 20%. And then if the price goes up higher, you sell 20% of what's remaining. And then if it goes up even higher, 20% of what's remaining. Now we're not selling one fifth every time. You're not gonna be out of gold after five sales because each time you're only selling 20% of what's remaining. So you're never going to sell everything. 
using this strategy. And you'll always have some of that left in your Today pockets. I'm going to be showing you with charts and data why we could realistically expect gold to go to $10,000 an ounce in this bull market. So let's get right into it. Okay, so here we're looking at the gold price going back to the early 1970s. So on the bottom here, you have the date, and then on the right column here, you have the price of an ounce of gold in US dollars. Now, I don't wanna go all the way back to 1971 because in 1971, the price of gold was $35 an ounce. However, that was fixed, that was price controlled. So that doesn't really count when looking at the performance of gold in the coming years. So let's start at approximately March of 1973 when gold was at $80 an ounce. It doubled in about a year. The price doubled in about a year, but then they were raising interest rates and they were trying to fight inflation and gold fell by quite a bit. And then it didn't get like a sustained double from $80 an ounce until 1977. So we have late 1977, uh, $80 an ounce, 1973. So we're looking at a sustained double in about four years. Now look what it did after we already had a double. We go from here all the way up here. But keep in mind that this, this chart we're seeing in the 1970s here is only updating every two months. So it's plotting one dot every two months. So there was a lot of price action in between each one of these dots here. So according to a chart I'm looking at, the actual high in 1980 was $843. Now that might have been like the daily close because I think it hit uh, 850 intraday. But anyway, so the top of this chart only shows about $700 an ounce. So it actually got $150 an ounce higher than that because this chart is only showing every two months. So what happened from $80 an ounce? So during the 1970s, if you forget about the price controlled $35 an ounce price and go to like what the market was after a couple of years, well, you had a 10X from there. What about today's bull markets? On this graph, it shows a low of 1081, but this is only every two months. The actual low was something like 1050 in late 2015. So what would happen if we more than 10X'd from 1050? Well, you're looking at like $10,500 an ounce. And so far we've had about a double from there. So perhaps you could expect another five times gain. Now, this is an investment advice and always do your own research, but I'm just talking about what could possibly happen. Okay, now let's look at another bull market. Now here we're looking at the 30 year chart and the bull market in 2001 started approximately here. Now this is a one month chart. So although the price says it was $263 an ounce, it did get a little bit lower than that. It was a a little above $250 an ounce. Let's see how long it took to double from the bottom. So let's see where we get to $500 an ounce. Okay, we're getting close. We're getting close. Okay, there we are. December 2005 from 2001. So it took about four years to get a double. Now where we're at today, From December 2015, we got a double at approximately five years, but we're not much higher than we were then. Like it consolidated for a while, and now we're still at approximately a double from the low. But let's go back here. Look what the price action did after it doubled. Look how much higher it went. A double looked really good at that point in 2005. However, if you look at the chart going all the way to 2011, it ran so much further. So now this is a monthly chart, so it doesn't show what the actual high was. It shows it as 1778, but let me take a look to see what the high was that year. So I'm looking at this chart, 2011. The high was 1896. Let's just call it $1,900 an ounce. So I'm just doing some calculations quickly on my other computer. So in the bull market of 2001 to 2011, we had a low price of $256 and a high price of $1,896. So that is a 738% increase. Now let's do a calculation to see what a 738% increase 
is from 1050, where this bull market started. 1050 times 7.38. So we're looking at $7,750 an ounce. Now, not quite $10,000, admittedly, but it's getting pretty darn close. Okay, so checking out the price action of gold over the last many years gives us one idea of where gold could go in this bull market, but let's look at it in another way. Let's look at the Dow to gold ratio over the last hundred years. So right now we're sitting at about 18. So that means it would take about 18 ounces of gold to buy one unit of the Dow today. Now, as you can see, it's not an all time high, but it's definitely way above average when looking at this chart that goes back over a hundred years. So average might be about six, a Dow gold ratio of six or so. And right now we're at about 18. So let's take a look at what the Dow gold ratio has done in these various bull markets in gold. 2011, you're looking at a Dow gold ratio uh, dropping to as low as about six. And 1980, almost down to one. And then 1930s, it got down below two. So right now we're at 18. It has a history of going down to two, down to one, and down to six. So let's say it gets down to three and the price of the Dow stays the same. That means we're getting a six times gain from where we're at today. And today we're sitting at almost 2,100 gold. So six X from there, you're looking at over $12,000 an ounce. So the previous gold bull markets have lasted about a decade. And in those, we got more than 10 X gains in one and about 7.5 times gains in another. And we started this one at about $1,050 an ounce. So if it goes up nine times from there, you're looking at $10,000 an ounce gold. Is that going to happen? Now, I don't know, but I certainly think it's a possibility, if not a probability. Now, this is just my guess looking at charts and data and comparing it to past bull markets. Now, the previous bull markets have lasted for about a decade, and we're already eight years into this one. Since we're eight years in and we've only gotten a double, I tend to doubt that this one will only last for a couple more years. So I think we have quite a ways to go from here, but we'll see how it plays out. It's anyone's guess. I'm just trying to look at data to get an idea of where gold might go in the future. We frequently hear that Franco Nevada and the other major gold and silver royalty and streaming companies trade at two times NAV. But today I'm going to show you why they're wrong. The gold analysts are wrong. And it's not that they trade at two times NAV, it's that the analysts are calculating the NAV wrong. So how do they do it? I'm going to show you a pretty quick and simple breakdown based on the idea that a company only has one royalty. So this is going to be a little demonstration based on one single royalty. Let's just pretend it's the entire company. Okay, so they have a royalty and their portion, let's just call this Franco Nevada. Franco Nevada's portion of this gold royalty nets them 50,000 ounces of gold a year, according to the mine operators mine plan. So the next 10 years, they're supposed to receive 50,000 ounces a year based on the current mine plan and the current output. So assuming gold is at 200 or excuse me, $2,000 an ounce, their 50,000 ounces of gold is going to be worth $100 million in year one. That's a terrible M. Okay, so $100 million in year one. However, then what the analysts do for year two, they're like, well, money in the future isn't as valuable as money today, which is perfectly reasonable. So then they're like, okay, so we're going to value year two at 90 million, year three at 80 million. Now this is a very simplistic version of this and this isn't exactly how it works, but it gives you a pretty good idea of how it works without going into too much detail. And then year four, we're at 70, year five, that same 50,000 ounces 
is at 60 million. And what they're doing here, they're assuming that the production is never going to grow, that it's just going to stay at 50,000 ounces a year because that's what the miner says their plan is. And that's what their current mill is operating at. And when they go to calculate how much each ounce is worth, they use the current price or the forward strip in the futures contracts. Uh, so year six, 50 million, year seven, 40 million, and so on down the line. And then basically anything after year 10 is almost considered valueless, according to analysts. Now, Franco Nevada, for example, they have gold royalties on copper mines that have 40, 50, 60 year mine lives. And these, these mine lives are going to expand as these uh, operators do more drilling. So they have gold royalties on mines that are going to be lasting a hundred years. They're still going to be producing a hundred years from now and they get virtually no value by analysts after year 10. So the analysts take these numbers. They're like, okay, this is, this is the net present value, the NPV right here per year. We add this up, uh, 100 plus 10 times five, uh, that's $550 million. That's the net present value of this royalty, according to these analysts. And then let's say the market cap is 1.1 billion, exactly double that. So the market cap 1.1 billion. And they say, okay, uh, they're trading at two times NAV because we calculated the NAV and their market cap is double that. But that is not the right way to value these royalty companies. There's a, this is very flawed logic here. Now, this is, this is a perfectly acceptable way to value your average gold miner, like Barrick Gold. However, with, not with the royalty business model, the royalty and streaming business model, this is a terrible way to value it. Why? Well, two main reasons. One is that the metal prices, whatever you have a royalty on, in the long run, they tend to go up over time. So keeping the assumption at $2,000 an ounce for every year in the future is not correct because 10 years from now, it's probably going to be significantly higher than $2,000 an ounce because over time, it just goes up and up and up. Like uh, the dollar becomes less valuable, there's more inflation and the cost of everything is rising and so do the cost, the price of the metals. But their assumptions say that gold is going to stay at whatever it's at today. So that's one major flaw in, in how they value it. And the second major flaw is they do nothing to accommodate for the fact, well, it's almost always a fact, that the mine operator is going to expand that production. They're going to expand that mill. And let's say they're uh, currently running uh, 10 million tons through it. Well, maybe on year three, they're like, hey, we're going to expand our mill and we're going to double production. So we're going to take it from 10 million tons of ore that we're processing to 20 million tons of ore that we're processing. So you know what happens? So let's say the plan that on year three, it takes a year to build. And then on year four, they're now running twice as much material through the mill. And our royalty company didn't have to spend any money to do that. And instead of getting 50,000 ounces a year, they're now getting 100,000 ounces a year. So by year five, the company is getting 100,000 ounces a year instead of 50,000 ounces a year that this model predicted Plus, the gold price is probably higher than it is today or whatever metal you have a royalty on. So that is why they calculate the NAV wrong. So it's not that Franco Nevada trades at two times NAV. It's that all the analysts 
are calculating it wrong because they're not taking into account mine expansion and they're not taking into account how the prices of the metals tend to increase over time. Now, this especially applies to the royalty and streaming companies that have royalties or streams on very long live mines. Because when you have a mine, when you're operating a mine that has, let's say, 50 years of mine life, producing anything 25 years from now, the market gives you no value for that. Because they're like, well, based on like the discounted cash flows, like it has no value 25 years from now. So what they do is they try to expand their minds and they bring that production forward. So instead of running 10,000, or I mean like 10 million tons of ore through it, they increase it to 20 million. So now their 40 year mine life becomes a 20 year mine life and they're producing twice as much and then the market gives them value for that. However, the, the gold stock analysts, when evaluating the gold royalty companies, they just assume that production is always going to stay the same. And on these super long life mines, that is just not the case. We don't know when exactly they're going to expand, um, but like there is lots of history showing that these, long, these operators that are operating these long life mines they always expand production over time. So that's how analysts get it wrong. Hope you got some value out of this. Please subscribe to the channel and click that like button because I release a new video on mining stocks and gold and silver and metals almost every single day. And I'll see you in the next one.